Well, good morning and welcome everybody to day 13 of the stage two hearings for the Windsor and Maidenhead Borough Local Plan. My name is Louise Phillips and I'm the inspector. Um, we're here today to discuss matter 11 in relation to um, development sites in Ascot, allocations AL 16 to 20 and also 32. And obviously tomorrow's session will include um, a couple of other sites, which will be of interest probably to the people here today. Just a, a reminder of the format of the session. I think we do have a couple of new participants. If you could please keep your microphones and cameras off when you're not speaking and then raise your hand when you wish to speak using the raise hand function in Zoom. And please, as usual, be prepared to say everything you need to on any given point in one go in case there isn't time to come back to you for a, a second go. Um, we will have a break during this morning's session. If you stay online, just turn off your microphone and camera. And then please also be aware that the session is being live streamed and recorded. So please note the council's privacy policy. If I could please ask the council to introduce themselves, please. Good morning, Mum. Ian Gillespie, Interim Planning Policy Manager. Thank you. Morning, Mum. Ian Mottschall, Principal Planning Policy Officer. Thank you. Morning, Mum. Matthew Smith, Planning Policy Officer. Morning. Uh, and we've also have uh, Mr. Beard, who's representing the council as council. Uh, and Mr. Vundelich, I believe, is uh, is also um, attending this morning. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to external participants, we have Ms. Toombs. Good morning, Diana Toombs, on behalf of the Ascot Sunninghill and Sunningdale Neighbourhood Plan Delivery Group. Thank you. And Mr. Fitzpatrick. We have Mr. Fitzpatrick. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Good morning, I'm, I'm Mark Fitzpatrick from Clean Slate and in respect of Englemere Lodge. Thank you. And Mr. Baker. Uh, Martin Baker, I'm a resident of Ascot and have been for the last 30 years. Thank you. Mr. Griffin. Good morning, can you hear me? I can, and see you, hello there. Uh, good morning, good morning ma'am. Patrick Griffin, I'm representing the Society for the Protection of Ascot and Environs. Uh, I was also a member of the steering group of the Neighbourhood Plan in its preparation and adoption, and I can trump Martin Baker on the basis I've lived in the area for 31 years. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Charles, please. Good morning, Mom. Karen Charles from Boyer Planning Consultants representing Shorts Group in relation to site AL17, the Shorts Waste and Recycling Facility. Thank you. And Mr. Lerner. Good morning, Mum. Peter Lerner, Charter Town Planner, representing the 13 local organisations, including the two Ascot based organisations who have already introduced themselves to you. Thank you. And do we have Mr. Mr. Koloff? Uh, morning, Mum. Uh, actually, Mr. Brown, uh, Brown, on behalf of the Crown Estate in relation to AL32, which is Sandwich House. Oh, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Barnett. Anthony Barnett, a local resident of Ascot and also representing other local residents. Thank you. And Mr. Scott. He's not here. Um, I've just emailed him. Okay. Just checking I haven't missed something. <laughs> thank you. And Mr. Patterson. Good morning, Mum. Chris Patterson from Turnbury, representing uh, Ascot Authority in respect of the Car Park Six site, which is part of AL16. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Anybody else who I haven't called? Yes, ma'am, I don't appear to be on that list. Sarah Duckfield from Turley. On Sorry, you, you are on my list. I've ah. got <laughs> you. Apologies. No okay. problem. Of Turley on behalf of the Ascot Consortium, ma'am, in relation to site AL16. Thank you very much. Anybody else? No, thank you. Okay, so we'll turn to the matters on the agenda. We're going to start with the placemaking area, QP1C, and a few other um, more general matters. Now, I did say in the sessions we had yesterday on Maidenhead, we, we had an introduction from the council last Thursday, I believe it was, to the placemaking um, areas. And we talked about the supplementary planning documents and a bit about the relationship to the neighbourhood plan, although I do have one more question on that. Um, I don't want to repeat anything that we spoke about last Thursday. Um, so if we talk again about that, that area and also about the tall building study, we need to sort of move it on perhaps from the discussion that we had at the end of last week. Um, but we'll start here with the three bullet points at the top of the agenda, beginning with the review of terminology. This is something that was raised by Mr. Baker very early in the examination. Um, and it was to do with confusion over what terms were used for which areas, as you can see there. Now things have moved on, thank you very helpfully um, by Mr. Baker and, and the council. And I've seen, I don't know whether everybody else has seen it, but the council has produced a, a paper um, sort of analyzing how the terminology is used. And I understand, although I haven't seen it, that Mr. Baker has responded to that and that the council is considering his response. Now, if there's no objection, I'm very happy to take the comments um, that Mr. Baker has made and um, also the, and the council's paper, rather than take a great deal of time in this session discussing the detail. I certainly don't want to spend a lot of time discussing individual paragraphs and references um, because it's all set out there. And if Mr. Baker has responded, that's fine. I think what would be most useful to me is just to clarify from that document which terms are supposed to be used in the plan to apply to which areas. Um, and if we can just sort of summarise that and then any detail, I'll, I'll perhaps leave to the, once that's agreed, leave to the council to resolve exactly which sentences need to be um, addressed in the plan. Um, I just need to know really the overall terms which are intended to apply to which areas and what that means for those areas. So if we could perhaps discuss this on this basis, if it's helpful, I, and I don't know if it will be helpful, but I could read out what I've picked out as the key terms that I think the council intends to use. And then you could add any more. So, so I've picked up that the Ascot strategic placemaking area you intend to use to cover the cube to describe the QP1C area, which is shown on figure five on page 49 of the plan. Yep. Correct. And that's to incorporate sites AL16 to AL20. Yes. Okay. And then <laughs> then I got confused, but I picked up the terms. I think the other terms I've picked up you intend to use are Ascot, Ascot Growth Location, Ascot Centre, Ascot District Centre. Yes, that's correct. Uh, I think the important point here is that the Ascot Centre would be used in relation to the AL16 site, and yeah. we wouldn't use Ascot Centre in relation to the placemaking area. Yeah, Okay. Perfect. Um, yes, did you want me to say anything more about that, Mom? I, I wondered if you could just clarify, because I, I think from, from your documents, you are also intending to continue to use the terms just ASCOT. Yes. And ASCOT's growth location. Yes, ASCOT growth location uh, and ASCOT uh, growth area, uh, we would continue to use, but uh, the, the ASCOT growth location is uh, essentially the same as the placemaking area. Um, right. So what else was there was I going to say? Um, this, yes, so, so, so Centre Ascot replaced by alternative re references, references to Ascot District Centre unchanged. And that's, although, that's, although, that's, sorry, and so the district, the district centre is the, the sort of specific definition for the purposes of policy TR1. That, that's correct, yes. I think it's TR1 and TR4, I believe, from memory. Okay. Yeah. Um, and um, yes, and that's that's first thing. And but but references to Ascot Town Centre will, where where possible, I think, be be removed um, because that term is not defined in the plan. Could cause confusion. Um, 
Uh, and uh, as I say, the um, although there's considerable overlap with the terms place making areas and growth locations through the plan, it's not proposed to change this as we think it's suitably clear. Um, yeah. But as, as you've said, the, the full details are within the appendix in our note. Um, and I'd just like to thank Mr. Baker for his helpful comments. Uh, we're very happy for you to accept those, ma'am, uh, in terms of an examination document. Uh, the council will review this. I've already, I've already started to review it. And we can certainly take uh, at least some of those, we'd be happy to, some of those comments, I think we can certainly accept. We just need to have another look at those to see if, if we can accept um, many more than that um, and I think the best way forward is, is for us to consider those and then update our notes perhaps. Okay. That's fine that's fine but essentially just for my just for my notes now the, the the sort of key ones in terms of how policy applies is that the strategic placemaking area is that is that specific area you've defined on figure five and that's where policy QP1 applies yes. and then you you're also occasionally going to use the term Ascot growth area or location yes. means the yes. same thing and then Ascot Centre is specifically used to describe AL16, which is that yes. allocation focused on the high street district yes. centre for the purpose of TR1 and TR4. Yes. And then, of course, you're occasionally going to have just the use of Ascot and whatever. But, th but those are the terms yes. that I've just said are, are relevant for policy purposes, really. Yes, that's correct. That's brilliant. OK, thank you. Well, let's just, just, just hear whether Mr Baker has any um, major concerns about that. Mr Baker, please. Uh, thank you. No, I think I'm, I'm sort of broadly happy with that. Um, I would just make the point that the legend on the Ascot policies map also needs to be changed to the Ascot strategic placemaking area. Um, okay. I think that's more of a consistency point. Uh, and I have raised one further point yesterday in my email, which I'm afraid I only spotted last week, in relation to the policies map. Um, that has a number of areas in the green belt shown as hatchings. Um, for example, south of the Heatherwood Sang and uh, much of the Ascot race course. Uh, I think these are local wildlife sites, um, but it's not, but they're not shown as such on the policies map. And I just ask this is clarified. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you for that. And thank you, Mr. Baker. If you can send your, I think I think the programme officer already has your comments, but if, if not, if you can send them to her, then they can be um, they can be passed on to me. But thank you for the work you've done. I think that saves us lots of lots of time going through everything this morning. So thank thank you for that. Um, let's let's move on then to the second bullet point here about the um, the strategic placemaking area, including those sites AL 16 to 20, which is where policy QP1C um, appears. Now, as I said, we've already discussed this to some extent last week, and I, I don't want to go over the same ground again. We did discuss yesterday in relation to the Maidenhead sites, whether there were any um, concerns about infrastructure. Uh, that could potentially be helpful if people want to raise that here. Um, but also, I just wanted, and this is perhaps a question for Miss Toombs, because I have now had a chance to have a little bit more of a look at the neighbourhood plan, um, as you were describing which sites it included. And I know that you are concerned about there being no need for an SPD, and you had some concerns about the sort of allocations in here. I just wanted to clarify, um, I've looked at the, the allocations, and I, the way I read it, you, if I say Ascot Village, the, and then... The Heatherwood Hospital, you've got in there shorts, the ho uh, hotel site, and then the two project areas of Ascot Green and Ascot Station. Some of those you've sort of said are okay for residential development, but I just wanted to make sure the neighbourhood plan doesn't ascribe a particular dwelling number to any of those sites. And so my question is, I would just wonder if um, you have concerns about how the council's done that. How, how would the council, if it didn't do its own work in relation to this area, know how much development to allow for on the basis of what's been done for the neighbourhood plan? Perhaps if I could just ask Miss Toombs, because that's just a bit of a follow up from, from last week. Hi, good morning. Um, I have quite a lot of other things to kind of go to, but I will answer your particular kind of question. Um, we actually did at the time discuss with the council um, putting allocations uh, in terms of numbers against kind of all the site allocations. 
and we were specifically advised and asked not to, uh, which we regret in retrospect, had we known then what we know now, we would have jumped up and down and insisted. Um, however, in most of the policies, we did uh, tie the allocations to townscape assessment characters, which give a pretty good uh, indication of the density that we envisaged and the nature and style of development. Um, and we did a lot of work on with the uh, council's uh, townscape assessment uh, because our area is typified by three or four distinct townscape characters. Mm -hmm. um, so we use those to reference the nature of development we expected on the site. And in areas like Heatherwood, we also kind of described the, the type of uh, mixed kind of development that uh, residents really were keen to sort of see there. Um, Sunningdale Park, we described, um, but in the end, the planning application that's been granted has killed it um, because it is a completely different level of density to what was uh, indicated in that policy. And it's also why we're so concerned that for Ascot uh, Centre, AL16, that the policy in the local plan uh, clearly sets out character types, and that's why we're concerned about the level of density. The level of density at Ascot has been determined since the neighbourhood plan very simply by um, the site promoters putting their hand up and saying we want X number of units and it's, it has jumped from the neighbourhood plan stage, it went up at the submission version and then went up again in the proposed changes version. And all of that has been done simply um, on site promoters promoting it for more and the council going great, we get some more numbers. The character uh, of the area has been disregarded and that's one of our key concerns. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I don't know at what point you'd like me to come no, uh, talk about uh, the general placemaking. Well, what, I'll, what I'll do now, and I know other people have got their hands up, but that was just a specific question that I, that I had. I just wanted to make sure that I was clear about what was in the neighbourhood plan. Um, and so what we'll do is I'll go back to the council, if I can, on bullet points two and three two and three on the agenda and then I'll come to others to say what you what you wanted to on that before we move on to the specific sites so if I could if I could hear for the counts from the council please on any any sort of more that you can offer on bullet point two and then if you wanted to say something um, about bullet point three which is we've just started to hear from Miss Toombs about the concerns of over density and I, I know that tree loss is another thing that keeps that, that keeps coming up um, and perhaps you could relate this back to the Victorian villages character area and things that we, that we keep hearing about. Uh, yes, thank you, ma'am. Um, I, I, the second bullet point relates to the uh, update on the um, uh, SPD preparation. And I think we've covered that already. So uh, unless you wanted me to say, repeat what, what I said no. last, last week, uh, I, I, won't, I won't do so, um, but... Uh, I think the next bullet point relates to concerns around density of development, tall buildings in around Ascot, and that obviously ties in with Ms. Coombs, Toombs' um, comment there. We do have our, our, our uh, tall buildings consultant available, so I'm just going to ask him to, to say a few words in, in response to this uh, first question, and then I'll come back to the next point, which I think is about trees. Uh, so, I, okay, thank you. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Hello. Uh, just on, on the tall buildings in, in Ascot, uh, we talked about it last week, so I'm trying to be uh, quick and specific. So there are three sites identified in our study for an opportunity for tall buildings. The height of those tall buildings in each of those locations is five stories. Uh, the intention is to um, mark specific places within Ascot uh, or, which are um, exposed and, uh, and prominent within the, the place. Um, the uh, three places are the station, the uh, Heatherwood uh, Hospital uh, on the uh, roundabout, the entrance into Ascot, and an opportunity within uh, the high street, uh, specifically within the uh, Ascot uh, Center development um, area. Uh, and this is, I think, where the concern arises about the Victorian Villages character area, which is within uh, Ascot Centre and covers Ascot Centre. Um, the uh, uh, proposal is to, uh, to 
the, the opportunity lies within Ascot uh, Centre around the village core, not within the village core as identified by the townscape assessment. And the sites identified um, as a um, uh, allocation site there covers areas which are outside the character, um, the townscape descriptions. Um, so there's an opportunity there to uh, bring forward a building of that scale if it helps to enhance legibility uh, in, an, in, in a way that it doesn't undermine uh, the um, character of the historic village. And indeed, the, the, uh, the, the tall buildings strategy asks these things to be very carefully considered in establishing the opportunity for a building of that scale. Um, there's an opportunity of uh, development coming up, uh, having a range of heights in this in the central area between two and four stories and the five story uh, opportunity for a tall building is an additional story to provide a sense of prominence on a particular place. And there is there's a description in the plan and uh, in, in the site allocation about the uh, opportunity for a village square. And this would be an opportunity to mark this village square uh, with a, uh, a slightly taller building. I also know that um, some of the sites had been looked at uh, by um, the Ascot Centre Development Brief, which was also prepared in consultation with local, for, uh, with local people, and the height there ranged from two to four stories, so it is consistent with that um, proposal, which I've uh, come across. The, um, the appropriateness of height on the station um, of five stories, there's uh, no existing a townscape character uh, on the site at, the, at present. There's an industrial estate to the south of the station. The station is itself situated in a, in a, in a, in a dip and surrounded by a, a strong vegetation. So the impact of a five-story building on the wider character uh, is, is, uh, is, is not uh, of, of, of uh, great concern here. And on the, um, on the Heatherwood Hospital site, uh, which is an, inst an institutional site in the character assessment. Uh, the opportunity here is to mark that uh, roundabout. And this mirrors a development which happened on the other side of the roundabout, which is already of five stories. So I think there's a consistent uh, there and we've looked at those areas uh, very carefully. So I hope that clarifies the position on tall building. Thank you very much. Area. Thank you. Apologies for the slight delay there, Mom. Just technical, small technical problem. Uh, moving to uh, trees, um, Ascot uh, is known for its green and leafy character, of course, and uh, several of the allocations uh, contain trees. Uh, the pro formas for AL16 to AL19 all require the retention of existing trees where possible. Um, AL20, the Heatherwood Hospital, requires structural planting and trees to the high street frontage. Um, there are two other policies, QP3, QP3 uh, and NR3 uh, that uh, are both concerned trees. So Q, QP3 requires that development proposals protect trees that are worthy of retention and NR3 similarly requires proposals should protect and retain trees, woodland and hedgerows. Um, so in, in conclusion, uh, the council uh, is satisfied that important protected trees that are of value to the area are not at significant risk uh, and that this can be covered at the planning application stage. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, at risk of some slight repetition creeping in later as we go through the sites, I'll, I'll hear from others who want to speak about the um, specific things that have just been mentioned by Mr. Vundelik and Mr. Motchul. So if we talk about any, any general matters you wish to raise, but also then the, the tall buildings and the, and the sort of general trees type issue and, and density, please. So anyone wanting to speak on what you've just heard, if you put your hand up now and then we'll move on specifically to, to AL16 and try not to repeat any points that are made now. 
Okay, let's hear from um, Ms. Charles, please. Thank you, Mum. Um, I'm just going to pick up um, on the point around capacity in particular. Um, and you'll remember I'm speaking in relation to site AL17, the Shorts Waste Transfer Site. Um, we discussed um, capacity um, of the site last week, so I don't believe you want me to repeat that um, now. But I think it is worth making the point that it's not right to simply suggest that developers have dictated the quantum of development on any of these sites. Um, and in particular, the case for AL17. The quantum of AL17 was initially assessed using um, the council's own methodology in the HELA and tested then by the current planning application that's subject of determination. Shorts Group appointed a leading traditional architect to help inform a potential master plan for that site. So the quantum of development actually has very much been character led. Uh, this has been then tested by the application and found to be acceptable in principle um, and as now demonstrated by this draft allocation. I think that's all I just want to say then. I've got other points, but I'll come back if you're happy when um, under AR17 later on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Toombs, please. Thank you. Um, please bear with me as I cover a certain amount of ground. Um, the key starting point about uh, policy QP1C, uh, sorry, can you see, see me? Yes. Yes, you can, okay. Um, is that it must deliver the community aspirations, uh, which are for the sensitive rejuvenation of Ascot Centre and High Street, as per the neighbourhood plan, which you have read. Um, I will also point out that our neighbourhood plan does exactly what the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission set out as their first aim, which namely, which was to promote better design and style of homes, villages, towns and high streets to reflect what communities want, building on the knowledge and tradition of what they know works for their area. This policy as currently worded does not deliver the vision. And if it doesn't do this in combination with Performer AL16 in particular, then the green belt land south of the high street cannot be released from the green belt. The only exceptional circumstances which justify its release is to deliver this community aspiration. Need for more housing is not sufficient as there are other green belt sites which would be sequentially preferable to this one in terms of its contribution to green belt. So if community aspirations are not delivered through this policy, releasing this land from green belt would make this plan unsound. Now, in terms of addressing some of the issues of character that have been raised already, the village um, denominate kind of description is very much what is applied to some of the development that's north of the high street. But kind of in the uh, neighborhood plan project, we specifically refer to townscape assessment classification of leafy residential suburbs and or late 20th century suburbs, because that actually is fairly typical of the a development that's taking place around the fringes of Ascot and it was seen that that would retain a lot of the open green space and feel of that site, uh, allow it to retain a lot more of the trees which I'll come on to again, while still delivering family homes. Um, in terms of touching on the tall buildings and at the risk of duplication was when we talked site specific, uh, the idea of a tall or large building there um, we talk about a village square, the clue is in the name village. You don't associate a great big building, you know, with a village square, nor do you associate it with the kind of family home residential development, a mixed use kind of development on the scale that Ascot is as a district centre. It is inappropriate in that location and reflects a level of density that is completely at odds with what is in the vision and the neighbourhood plan. What would you say about this idea that we keep hearing about um, for improving legibility, marking this village square? We don't need to mark. The village square marks it, a community hub of modest scale. And in fact, one of the arguments we had with the council in the Ascot Consortium placemaking sessions is they wanted to hide the village square round the back to put it in the middle. And we were saying, no, the whole idea is open access to it from the high street with a community building next to it, which 
sort of the parish council offices can sit. And that is what marks that site, not some great big landmark building. There are so many landmarks in this plan. Um, there's an obsession with them. Similarly with Ascot Station. Now, if we want a landmark for Ascot Station, we have one. It's called the very highly prestigious McLaren Car Showroom. You know you've arrived at Ascot. It's right next to the station. It sits at the same level at the, as the station, which is towards the top of the slope, which then does slope down. And any tall building that is going to embark or height impinge on that would actually destroy the existing landmark. It's a desktop exercise makes sense because you've got a slope, yes, but in actual real life when you see it, it doesn't make any sense at all. Heatherwood is slightly different because yes, we recognize there are relatively tall buildings on the Heatherwood Hospital site right now. And our only objection uh, when we discussed the plans, which Heatherwood, uh, Frimley Trust and Fairness, went into enormous level of consultation with the local community. And our only kind of um, point of difference with them was how close to the road frontage those tall buildings went. If they were set back a bit more, because at the moment we believe that the belt of landscaping that's allowed for isn't sufficient to screen the level of height of buildings they're proposing, from the road frontage. But again, in terms of landmark, you know you've arrived at Ascot, it's, to, it's the tip of that race course area. It's obvious, you can see the grandstand are coming up on your left, you know you're in Ascot. So we don't need a landmark to tell people, you know, wave a flag that they've arrived at Ascot. Now, moving on to the placemaking policy itself, in terms of constructive suggestions, we firstly propose that the heavy black line on the map that is included uh, in paragraph 6.8.8 is redrawn around the area where development and infrastructure improvements will be focused. This basically encompasses sites AL 16 and 17. Including anything else is meaningless as it is these developments that will influence the nature of the development there and also the delivery of the community benefits and infrastructure required. It is this need for site promoters to jointly help fund this that is the crucial role of the placemaking policy. Much of the rest of the quotes about exemplar design requirements and so on can be dealt with in the individual performers. Um, in relation to this, as a, a little bit of an aside, but an important one, um, we must express again residents' concerns that SIL funds from developments in Ascot should be ring-fenced for funding these important necessary public realm and infrastructure improvements. Uh, we were concerned about what was implied by Mr Joyce yesterday when he assured us that Maidenhead transport infrastructure was deliverable because, and I quote, we collect SIL from around the borough for strategic infrastructure. That does not bode well for the infrastructure needed in ASCO. Uh, in the policy, uh, the community building along with the village square is fundamental uh, to justifying its release from green belt. And uh, we would suggest therefore that its prioritization in the updated item F4 in the IDP 040, which is currently classed as medium priority, we believe should be amended to high priority as it forms a key part of the justification for the site's release from Green Belt. Um, more detail about QP1C, um, and apart from the obvious question of why it isn't more closely based on our neighborhood plan policies, uh, are taking into account the, what we had in the project. Uh, paragraph 155, you must remember of the MPPF, does make it clear that local plans should reflect a collective vision and a set of agreed priorities, including those contained in made uh, neighborhood plans. The first paragraph in this policy, while perhaps well intended, is actually a meaningless nonsense. Um, if read carefully, I think it's saying that the center of Ascot will be rejuvenated as a vibrant multi-use green space. Now, whether the center of Ascot is the high street or the station, neither can be described as a green space. We don't understand that. Why is it to be a retail focus for visitors to the race course? Isn't it to be a retail focus for residents as well? And what does proactive management of change actually mean? We believe that this clause needs redrafting. 
Uh, we've already vigorously argued against a placemaking SPD for Ascot. Um, in any event, at least half the proposed development will have been approved uh, by the time one is produced. Uh, so paragraph three should only include, as we've suggested, AL16 and AL17. Paragraph, the next paragraph on uh, traffic calming measures. Why? Traffic congestion <laughs> means that we have very few problems with traffic speeding. And as Mr. Gillespie has agreed, policy should set out the objective rather than preempting possible solutions. The objective is improvement of the flow of traffic along the high street, more likely to be addressed by reducing the number of right turns off it, as suggested in the consortium's own traffic work. Another objective is improved pedestrian crossings. Also, more important for the retail success of the high street is the retention of the on-street parking along it, which has been raised at every placemaking session and every consultation, but is not mentioned here. Paragraph 5b refers to Village Square, uh, but the, then rather obscurely refers to community uses and civic buildings. Why not simply and clearly a community building, which is what the vision is about? That needs to be specified either here or in Performer AL16. The words in paragraph 5c that read development close to the high street that has a distinct and exemplar design is sympathetic to local character and reflects the local architectural vernacular. Uh, as you've already read in the neighborhood plan, uh, we make specific reference to appropriate townscape types, which I read kind of a short time ago. So that's what should be reflected here. Uh, in 5d, we certainly want to improve connectivity but what is intended by overcoming transport and physical barriers such as the railway line? The railway line crosses the bottom of Station Hill over a bridge and comes into Ascot Station. There is access from the station to both South Ascot and up the hill to Ascot Centre. Why is the railway line relevant? Uh, we fail to understand how placemaking policy 5e can, quotes, encourage racecourse visitors to use sustainable means of transport to reach the venue and local communities to use their cars for fewer trips. That's not policy. I mean, it's just an aspiration. Regarding trees, which was a specific question, the trees on the Greenbelt land south of the high street have a blanket TPO. There are over 40 category A trees, over 20 mature category B ones, plus several smaller ones. The trees on AL17 shorts are also subject to a blanket TPO. And it's therefore not surprising that firstly, we're arguing in AL16 for lower density that will allow more of these trees to be retained. We do understand some will have to be sacrificed, but the sheer number that will have to be sacrificed to achieve that density is unacceptable. Uh, and therefore we require kind of something much stronger wording, as I think we've raised before, than simply retain uh, mature trees where possible. That's meaningless. There should be some proper measure put in place about both retention and mitigation for those that are removed. Um, in 5i, we're interested to read about the provision of new employment opportunities on the Ascot Business Park, uh, which is completely unrelated to uh, the high street uh, area and Ascot Centre and the rejuvenation. Uh, we're unclear what new employment opportunities this is. We suspect this refers to the existence of an underutilised car park adjacent to Ascot Business Park, which we believe is owned by the council. It could have been allocated for mixed use employment um, as a mixed use employment site. And the principle of that is great, apart from some traffic and access nightmares to be resolved. But it shouldn't be allowed to creep into a policy here through the back door uh, without anything else kind of to address the issues surrounding it. Um, and finally, really, we're moving towards the end of kind of this issue of you know, the placemaking policy is that um, the council is still trying to avoid the issue of traffic congestion. The uh, cu our current neighborhood plan policy SS 1.2 states that any proposal for the redevelopment of Ascot Centre and High Street should take into account the following community aspirations. I'm only reading two of them. 
improvements to the road infrastructure, specifically including the high street, the roundabout at its junction with Wingfield Road, the entry into St. George's Lane and the roundabout at the top of Station Hill. And the second one is sufficient car parking for residents, local shoppers, workers and visitors to include a dedicated short-term car park for the local community. Parking is not mentioned in the placemaking policy at all, and yet it is a crucial area. Um, without car parking and without the traffic improvements, this development is unsustainable. And interestingly, although we don't agree with everything ASCO Consortium have worked on, a lot of what they did in their traffic study does reflect and pick up on a neighborhood plan a good deal more than this local plan policy does. Okay. Um, what I'd like is to, if, I, if you'll bear with me, there's something that relates to infrastructure that came out of the um, new IDP, which is broader than just us got placemaking area. And could I cover that now? As okay. we've had no other opportunity. Um, it has long been acknowledged that our end of the borough lacks the quality of leisure facilities enjoyed by Maidenhead and Windsor. So the announcement by the then leader of the council, Simon Dudley, that an application for a 15 million Oaks leisure centre in Charters Road, Sunningdale had been approved at a panel meeting on the 4th of September, 2019, was greeted with acclaim. The council also announced the capital funding being agreed by full council it was hoped that the new leisure centre would open by spring 2021. But we see no mention of this leisure centre in the updated IDP. Uh, and a search on the council's planning portal shows that the application is still awaiting determination with the last documents uploaded dating to October 2019. We would like to ask the council whether there is or is not a commitment um, and a need to provide a new leisure centre for Sunningdale, Ascot and Sunning Hill. Uh, but there is no mention in the IDP to this effect. Uh, and I suppose that this, this also demonstrates clearly why we have so little faith in the council's promises on infrastructure delivery. And it explains why we're sitting here arguing for small detailed changes to policy because they are they're going to be the only way of trying to ensure that what is intended is actually delivered. Thank you. I've site specific stuff, which to come to later. Thank you. Well, let's go back to the council before we move on to the specific sites, because I think that'll provide the opportunity to um, raise any detailed issues in any case. Oh. Coming back to the to, to the council on that, um, we've obviously heard sort of specific concerns raised um, in relation to potential proposals for AL16 and AL18. Um, can, I, can I just ask, following on from, I think it was a discussion we had yesterday um, about the extent to which the tall buildings proposals were relied on to achieve the density. How necessary are the tall building proposals to achieve the dwelling numbers that are proposed in the plan versus them being more for placemaking, for example? Very good question. <laughs> um, okay, well, obviously we want to uh, ensure that the character of Ascot is retained, uh, and uh, but we also need to 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 try to maximise good use of land. So there's always a bit of a tension there. Um, so we certainly, in terms of Ascot, it probably goes without saying that we're we're not looking at the uh, you know the sort of densities that we'd be looking high buildings that we'd be looking at in, in places like Maidenhead it cl clearly is a very very different character um but uh so yes it's part of place making uh, we think making good use of urban land uh, and it's about taller buildings uh it's not about tall buildings in Ascot um and uh, we did um I don't know if you wanted me to come on to this but there, there is a on the agenda uh, a modification modification to clause five uh, regarding the need to respect existing context height. So we, we have uh, said in our MIQ response uh, 11421 that QP1C could be amended or should be amended to make it more explicit that on development on sites close to Ascot High Street, uh, they should be sympathetic to existing context heights. So we do recognise the importance of character and we're not looking at very tall buildings. Mm. 
Would you like me to respond to one or two of Mr. Toombs's comments? Yeah, you can do. I'll, I'll, I'll perhaps. Um, I know that Mr. Patterson has his his hand up, and I'll I'll come to him briefly in a minute, and then because and then we'll move on to AL sixteen before I hear from others, because I think otherwise th things will keep coming up, and then and then duplicating. But I, I I do just wonder whether I'll be able to hear a little more from the people making the proposals, possibly about these um these tall buildings, because <clears throat> I guess. I guess it's another one of these things where things are sort of deferred to the SPD. People feel strongly about them. I mean, I don't have the SPD in front of me to know exactly what is going to be proposed in relation to a tall building for that site. And it isn't perhaps, it's not, it's not terribly clear how much flexibility there will be in that SPD to sort of take account of some of these um, character, you know, detailed sort of character points and concerns being raised. And so I guess the... Con what, I, what I'm trying to be clear on is, is, is this plan that I'm examining basically going to allocate, essentially allocating a five story building on AL 16 and AL 18. And so I need to be absolutely sure that that is the right thing to do now, or is there some flexibility in that? that, that that's, that's the sort of concern I have in my mind. My, my, my instant answer, I suppose, would be that that there, there needs to be some flexibility uh, at the planning application stage. I don't think we'd want to be too prescriptive at this stage. Um, I think at the moment, the uh, Ascot development brief uh, does, does talk about four storey buildings. Uh, and, and I think our, our tall buildings work as, as indicated, Mr. Mr. Bundelich can say more, obviously, any problem in terms of that. And I think we've suggested possibly four to five stories on that site, but I think it, it's not absolutely set in stone, I would have thought at this stage. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Carry on with carry on with the other points, please. Excuse me, madam. Can I just certainly? Yep. Apologies, apologies for that. No, no uh, problem. Take take uh, your time. So. Just turn the video back on. Okay, just to come in, just to respond to. Couple of Mrs. Ms. Toombs's points. Um, I think, if, in terms of the uh, area for the placemaking, the boundary of the placemaking area shown on Figure Five, um, I think uh, the council's uh, strong view is that the boundary, as shown on that figure, is is appropriate. Um, we, as we've, dis I think, as we as we've mentioned before, um, the placemaking. For Ascot, we, we see it as, as being more than just the development sites around the high street, important though they are. Uh, and to, and merely this point that I've mentioned before about the, the importance of the station, uh, uh, in, a, in a sense, as a, as a, as a symbol for, for encouraging more sustainable modes of transport, uh, uh, and also having South Ascot uh, in, in, within that area as part of the. Uh, attempts to improve connectivity between that community and the high street um, and also the, the, the mention about the business centre as well again we, we, we see that as, as important uh, reference in the policy um, and, and, and certainly no, no attempt to, to uh, try to allocate sites to, through the back door I think as, as, as was indicated um, but uh, just uh, fin finally I think in terms of the pro this issue about um, whether trees, um, the, the point about where possible. I mean, obviously, we, we're going to be reviewing the, the pro formas in any case um, shortly. So we, we can have a, have a look to see whether or not we think that the reference where possible need, needs to be a little stronger. Um, uh, and uh, I think uh, just in terms of car parking, um, I, think, I think the importance there is, is that we're, we're trying to encourage um, you know more sustainable modes of transport as, as well as the use of the private car so again it's a, it's a balance we, we, we appreciate that there may be limits to how, how much realistically we can improve bus services for example but we've, we've got a train station very very, very close um, and finally just in terms of the point about the uh, the the IDP and the leisure centre we haven't we haven't got Mr Joyce with us today but uh, I, say, I think the key point really is that uh, all the infrastructure that's that's planned and, and is necessary for, for the borough local plan to, to deliver the local plan is within the IDP. So if that leisure centre is not, not in the IDP, and I believe that to be the case, then 
essentially is not at the moment planned. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's hear briefly from Mr. Patterson and Mr. Wunderlich, and then we'll move on to AL16. Thank you, Mr. Patterson. Thank you, Mom. Um, I mean, it was really just a couple of quick points. Um, and just uh, to pick up on Diana Turm's uh, excellent uh, dissection of uh, the policy in relation to Ascot. Um, I mean, it just goes back to what I was saying last week, which is um, these policies have been rather imposed and they are trying to overwrite aspects of the neighbourhood plan. I think last week I made the case that that there is a complementary approach fighting to get out of this plan. And I think with modest adjustments to wording and policy, um, if there is anything missing in the neighbourhood plan, uh, and you, made a, you asked a question about housing numbers, for instance, if there's anything missing, this is an opportunity for uh, the local plan to put a supportive wrapper around the neighbourhood plan rather than try and um, take control of elements which are working perfectly fine and the community have thought a lot of spent a lot of time and effort thinking about um, and I think it is concerning that a place making policy for Ascot has been arrived at without um, detailed consultation with both the community and, and development interests and that um, you know the fact that there is uh, such a broad discrepancy between the views of the um, neighbourhood planning committee and the council i think is, is concerning particularly when you review statements within the mppf about the importance of neighbourhood planning uh, that it's there to um, support st strategic development needs um, uh, and that local plans should facilitate neighbourhood planning and i think at the moment we're in danger that that that, that's not the case, that the, the two are fighting with one another. Thank you. Uh, we, we covered that, I think, last week, and I, I've, got, I've got those points. I, I understand that. What, what I wonder if you could help me with, is I'm still struggling with this, this tall building point, um, I must say, I think as the council was picked up. And as you are preparing development briefs, and whatever, for the site, are, are you able to shed any light on how necessary the tall building policy is in order to meet the development requirements AL16. Well, I think on that specific point, I think I'll hand over to um, Sarah, who um, was more int intimately involved in preparing the development brief. So if I could ask Sarah just to come in and answer that point, uh, that'd be helpful. She might need just to um, gather her thoughts, perhaps speak to Matthias first, and then Sarah can come in. Okay. And then we'll move on to AL16, I think, to talk about the, um, the, the sort of details of that policy. Okay, Mr. Van der thank you. Hi, uh, just to um, clarify uh, your, your question uh, about uh, are we uh, requiring a tall building to deliver housing numbers? Uh, the intention of the tall building uh, strategy is to help with placemaking and appropriateness of height in relationship to context in terms of townscape as well as heritage and other, <coughs> excuse me, sensitivity. And in that context, we identified a potential opportunity for, as we call a modest landmark mixed use building in Ascot um, Center. As you hear, it's a potential. It is not saying there must be one. We're saying there's, uh, there could be a rationale for a tall, a tall building of that scale there uh, in terms of pla place making as part of comprehensive development uh, in helping to mark the center. Uh, and I think the context to this is um, that obviously we are we needing to intensify places. We are in climate change. We are we are having to build more sustainable. We have to increase densities where they are um, served by existing facilities and infrastructures. And that is an underlying approach to development, and an underlying approach to where the the, the the uh, council, the local authorities try to concentrate development. Uh, in that context, development will come forward of higher densities, often of, of what is there. And the, the, the toll building strategy aims to give a guide, a very 
specific guide on what this would mean in tall buildings. And I would say, uh, while people are seemingly concerned about five stories in, uh, in, in Africa town center, uh, I would say that part of what the strategy aims to do is to say, we think there's an opportunity potential for one building which could go up to that height. And by, by doing so saying, we don't think there's an opportunity for lots of buildings going up to five stories or indeed for buildings going up higher than five stories. And I think we, we have to recognize the benefit of the strategy in that respect, because we know what development, uh, if it's not curtailed, uh, and development aspirations uh, on certain sites can bring forward. And if there's a, if, if there's a direction to intensify centers, such as Ascot, then a developer without that specific guidance might suggest to bring developments forward up to seven or eight stories in certain places. And in that context, uh, we, we, we see our strategy operating and saying, well, uh, while there is an argument for uh, marking a new center as part of comprehensive approach development and uh, a, a clear townscape rationale for that, it should be only one in that particular circumstance. And so there is flexibility. It is not meant to increase density and is necessarily as such, although it will obviously, as, as, as part of its nature, help to increase density a bit. And I think that is in, a, in the wider context, uh, certainly welcome, because but it is not the intention. Thank you, that's, that's helpful. Thank you very much. Um, Stutfield. Thank you, Mom. Sorry, the light's really bad here, so hopefully you can still hear me. And I think just coming back to your question about um, about heights, the draft development brief as it was submitted to the council um, included a range of heights and suggested heights, the, the tallest of which was four storeys and which was within one of the mixed use buildings and set back at the higher level. Um, so not four storeys in a straight facade, but three storeys and setback. Everything else was three storeys and below. So we don't feel that there is a requirement for specifically tall buildings and certainly not up to the heights around five storeys that have been talked about. Thank you. OK, Mr Gillespie, and then we'll move on to L16. Thanks, Mr Gillespie. Mom, well, just want to... To very briefly add to, to what Mr. Motchell has already said in terms of the position with the, um, with, with the tall building references uh, and just sort of taking a step back really in terms of what the, um, what the plan must achieve, the, the local plan. Uh, and clearly one very important consideration is, is finding sites to meet the borough's uh, housing needs. And, and I think in terms of the, the local plan um, allocations uh, and the local plan policies, they do provide a slight shift in emphasis um, for the Ascot area. I think the council acknowledges that. Uh, char character is, is still a very important consideration, um, but the local plan housing needs uh, must be accommodated. Uh, and Ascot is a growth location and that, I think, is where um, some of the some of the tensions that are being discussed between the neighbourhood plan work and what the borough local plan is now proposing for the Ascot area. That, 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 that is where those tensions are arising from. Um, and, it, and it is this um, slightly different emphasis, uh, character important, but also making sure that the borough's housing needs are met. Uh, and Ascot, as I say, is, is, is a growth location. I think in terms of the um, building heights, um, we can pick this up, I think, as part of our review of the site allocation pro formas. Uh, and I think we can indicate some priorities uh, regarding building heights, but they wouldn't need to be specified in, in absolute um, terms in terms of stories. But, but all the time recognizing the, a very important consideration for the, for the local planning authority both at the plan making stage, but also at the development management stage, will be meet, will be seeking to meet um, the the housing uh, capacities that are that are set out in the plan uh, as part of the overall uh, objective, clearly, of meeting the borough's housing needs. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Let, let's move on to to AL sixteen. Obviously, some of it's been. I don't, I don't want to talk about tall buildings again. 
in AL16. And I'll, I'll give some thought to that, but thank you. I mean, it's, it's, it's helpful. Um, it's, it's something I'm grappling with. And uh, I think it's very useful to hear, to hear sort of both sides of that um, argument. Um, right, so moving on to AL16. I've got some specific questions on the agenda, um, which you can see there on that. So, which are covered in two bullet points, which I'd like the council to address first. And then I'll hear from others in relation to both of those um, points and anything else that we haven't already covered um, that you want to say in relation to AL16. It might be more, more useful perhaps if um, we hear from the, the sort of site promoters at, at the end of anybody else who wants to speak. So you could pick up any of the points that they've raised as well. So the first point is, should separate allocations be made to the north and south of the high streets to reflect the advanced planning stage reached in respect of the north and or the different characters of the areas? Um, and then the second is a more specific point about the need for roundabout improvements at Station Hill. And this is again, I think I think you'll probably say that flexibility is required, but I, I've asked this question because I think the, the proposals already sort of indicate that that's necessary. So it's whether it's whether it's necessary to require that or whether it can be left to the, the planning application stage. So if I could ask the council to perhaps address that and then I'll hear from others. So if others who want to speak in relation to AL16, not tall buildings, but anything else, put it up your hand. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Ascot Centre, uh, as, as uh, stated in the response to our MIQ question 11.423, the part of AL16 to the north of the High Street was known in the Ascot, Sunning Hill and Sunning Dale neighbourhood plan as Ascot Village. It's also known as Car Park 6 uh, and is in the ownership, I understand, of the Ascot Authority uh, owners of the race course. So, we understand that uh, Car Park 6 may come forward sooner than the rest of the site in terms of a planning application. Uh, the council does not, however, agree that AL16 should be separated into the, the sites to the north and south of the High Street. Um, the boundary uh, in the proposed changes plan uh, corresponds closely with the area covered by the Ascot Consortium Development Brief which was, um, as we've discussed before, submitted to the council back in 2018. Given that this is a well-established area, uh, promoted uh, for development in a development brief uh, relatively recently, um, it, it's logical in our view that the allocation in the proposed changes plan covers the same or, or at least a similar area. Um, it's noted that the consortium themselves support the current boundary of AL16 in the proposed changes plan. Um, and of course, there is, as we've discussed before, nothing to prevent individual landowners and developers from progressing parts of the site separately, um, provided, of course, that they accord with the requirements set out in P QPC. QP1C uh, and the site AL16 pro forma, uh, requiring the delivery of comprehensive development that is integrated with other sites nearby. Moving to the second question about the uh, roundabout improvements at Station Hill, um, there, there, are, there are two uh, understand roundabouts on the high street close to the allocation AL16. So one is at the western end, which is the at the junction with Station Hill. Um, and then there's another at the eastern end, uh, the junction with Winkfield Road. Uh, the council does not consider that the pro forma should be amended to specify that these two roundabouts must be increased in size. This would be uh, too detailed. Uh, we feel, and reduce flexibility to consider other potential solutions and is therefore more appropriately dealt with at the planning application stage. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so if I, I'll hear from um, Ms. Toombs and Mr. Baker, then Mr. Patterson and Ms. Dutfield, just in case you need to pick up anything that they have said as well. So um, Ms. Toombs, please. Thank you. Uh, 
actually, I'd like to point out to the council that Ascot is actually only a growth location because the neighborhood plan proactively identified this opportunity. It has since been picked up by the council, um, uh, but without that, it wouldn't have come forward at all. So we're not against development. What we're concerned about is to ensure it's right for the local community. Um, talking about, first, your first question uh, regarding splitting AL16 or not. I mean, if policy QP1C is well drafted, which it isn't currently, uh, it probably doesn't matter whether AL16 is uh, performed as one site or two. Um, and kind of, we don't have a kind of fixed kind of view on the subject and would be quite happy for, to see them come forward um, at different times as appropriate. Regarding the detail of the, um, the, the site performer, and I'm not going to cover themes of consistency, emissions and so on, which we've done uh, quite a lot. Um, but I have to point out again, crucially, that that third bullet point refers to a village square with community slash cultural slash leisure slash retail uses. That is not sufficient to ensure delivery of a community building, which is a key part of the community aspiration. Uh, we've talked about trees. Um, we, uh, we question the value of a travel plan unless some organization is vested with the responsibility of monitoring and enforcing it, because otherwise what value has it got as a policy? Um, regarding the uh, improvements to the two roundabouts, uh, what Mr. Motchul is suggesting is to go against the made neighborhood plan, which has set in policy the requirement for improvements to the road infrastructure, specifically including the high street, the roundabout at its junction with Wingfield Road, the entry into St. George's Lane and the roundabout at the top of Station Hill. That is currently policy in the local development plan. Um, critically, bullet point 15, and I think Mr. Gillespie did say that they will be numbered rather differently in this final version, which would be helpful. But is, this is about the exemplar quality design, and that's far too vague. What does exemplar quality design mean? Uh, it should be amended to refer to townscape types for guiding the character and nature of the new development as referred to in our neighborhood plan. Um, we've talked about tall buildings, so we're not going there kind of again. Um, we're also frankly appalled by Mr. Motchul's comments that the omission of any reference to car parking uh, is intentional because we want to promote non-car means of transport. Uh, yes, we can promote modal changes to the way people behave, but uh, if anybody wishes to ask a kind of elder, relatively elderly person of whom we have several living in the area to walk or cycle up from the station to the high street, I think that's a little unreasonable. Um, we have a lot of people that drive their children to school because there are no safe cycle and pedestrian ways of getting them to school otherwise. They drive. The retailers have made it very clear in all the placemaking um, that without <coughs> the on-street parking being retained, which by the way the consortium proposals include retention of, uh, that those retailers will not be viable. As a shopper in Ascot High Street myself, I know if I don't find a car parking space conveniently to hand, I don't bother stopping. It's apt. And we then have the whole issue of uh, the way in which the nighttime economy is going to operate. You know, if we're going to have a vibrant night economy, are people really going to then walk home you know, to the other end, you know, sort of two or three miles away? Um, bus services are a joke. We have kind of very limited, um, we have, I think, one, maybe two routes that run a very limited service that does not include peak times because they're busy doing school runs. So there is no bus service that would take people to the station to go to work on time, or that would take retailers to their shops to open them up on time or to go home on time. They're all busy doing school runs. So, it's completely unrealistic not to allow for parking properly within the planning, within the planning policy. Um, and kind of talking about pedestrian and cycle links, I think that the other thing that to kind of raise, which is broader than just this placemaking area, but has not been covered elsewhere, is that 
it's acknowledged that there is a need of improved cycle and pedestrian routes for children going to charter secondary school, particularly as that is earmarked for further expansion. Um, that at the moment is something that, that needs to be delivered through the local plan. The school is in Sunningdale. It serves a whole catchment area of Sunningdale, Ascot, Sunning Hill, Cheapside, and the whole surrounding area is what are the one big secondary school in our area. And there are no safe cycling routes for children to get to that school. Charter school have run projects trying to solve it. We have run projects trying to solve it. The only way to solve it is through the local plan. Um, and final point, and then, I, then you're rid of me for until the next one. <laughs> um, I can't understand why Mr. Module is fixated about South Ascot connectivity with the uh, Ascot Centre. South Ascot is a thriving local centre in its own right. It's got shops, a school, a pub, and a village green. Uh, despite the steep hill, uh, which separates Ascot and South Ascot, there is quite good connectivity by both road and footpaths. Uh, there's access to the station from South Ascot in the same way there is from North Ascot. Um, it, you know, it, it, it's a nonsense. Connectivity between Heatherwood and the station is kind of important, but that would be dealt with by the Heatherwood development and is part of the discussion of the planning application so that you can go direct from the station into Heatherwood without, without kind of going up Station Hill and along the length of the high street. But South Ascot and Ascot, nobody's ever asked for, for kind of improved connectivity there. So I've no idea where that's coming from. The growth area, placemaking area is frankly nuts because um, the sites are coming through independently anyway. Heatherwood has got planning uh, permission. Uh, Shorts has got, um, is in awaiting determination. Uh, what's the point of this placemaking? Thank you. Thank you. Before I just come on to Mr. Baker, just so I don't lose all my notes, a question, it won't be for you, Ms. Toombs, it's okay. Oh, okay. So I want to come back to the council on. Um, which probably Mr. Motchwell or Mr. Gillespie, um, should the pro forma or QP1C make specific reference to, um, you can think about this if you don't want to answer now, that's why I thought I'd say it now, should the pro forma or QP1C make specific reference to a community building um, and to the retention of car parking on the high street? Um, because that seems to be coming out as key to the community aspirations. Um, and then I wonder if I could ask, I don't know whether Mr. Beard might be able to help me. It could be at the end of this um, session. It could be at the end of the discussion of QP1 um, C AL16, because it's a slightly different, slightly different point. It's more about um, when you have these two layers of policy in the local plan and the neighborhood plan, how they will relate together, because there's obviously a problem where there would be a, an obvious clash of policy where one is completely different to the other. But some of the things I'm hearing, you know, when we have reference in this policy to exemplar design, and then Ms. Toombs is concerned about the neighbourhood plan and what it says about design and, um, you know, relating it to townscape character, how will those two policies work together when a planning application is determined and that's perhaps a question I don't know if a, perhaps, perhaps a legal point if Mr Beard could help us with that I mean I don't know if you want to answer those questions now Mr Watcher, or just wait and see what Mr Baker has to say as well I just wanted to say them now before I forget so you can either answer now or think about it happy to uh, um, speak after Mr Baker okay thank you let's hear from Mr Baker Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to pick up on a couple of points um, that Diana Toombs made. And all I really want to say there is that I agree with everything she said. Um, I do live in South Ascot um, and the con connectivity with Ascot Centre, um, I haven't heard anybody seriously complaining about. Um, I shop in Ascot Centre at the moment. But if I can't find a car parking space there, if this all goes through, you know, I'm going to go to Sunning Hill, Sunningdale. I'm afraid the shops in Ascot Centre uh, are, are going to miss out. Um, I'd like to go back to the Prince's Foundation report of 2013, 
on which the neighbourhood plan was based and on which the borough claims underpins the Ascot placemaking policy. I think it's helpful that, that and it provides some background and granularity both to the neighbourhood plan and to the pro proposed borough plan and also to what we've been talking about this morning. Now on looking back I can see that a number of parties have referred to this report in their written and oral submissions and the ASCOT consortium has provided a useful one-page edited summary of, in their development brief. But I was wondering, ma'am, whether it might be helpful if you received a full copy of the report. And if so, I do have a copy and could send it through. What is it that you wanted to draw out of relevance? Okay, well, I'll, 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 I'll continue through. Um, the the, the neighbourhood, the, the printish report uh, gave various uh, density figures for the um, for AL16. And that gave a, a figure of between about 156 and 182 dwellings for a total area of about 8.9 hectares and a built area of only about 5.85 hectares. Those now form the core of AL16. AL17 wasn't part of the Prince's Foundation report, although it's relevant to note there's a plan in the report that shows a long-term vision for that site as light industrial units, not housing. The Prince's Foundation described Ascot Green as a development tucked into the landscape, taking advantage of the large trees that dominate. I think that's a concept that's gone missing over time. And the report also stated that any development Ascot of Ascot Green and Ascot Village should be on a similar scale to the existing village. Now what the BLP sufficient version and, the, and, and proposed changes now proposes for the centre of Ascot are 431 dwellings for AL 16 and 17 on a total area of 18.1 hectares that's an increase in dwellings and density of over 44% compared to the submission version of the local plan. And there are three key points to be made here. The first is that the number of dwellings now proposed for the centre of Ascot, AL 16 and 17, is about 137% more than that in the Prince's Foundation report. And even if one looks at AL 16 alone, it's about 65% more. And that's bound to impact on the character of the centre of Ascot. It's way in excess of any sympathetic development that residents voted for in the neighbourhood plan. Second is that what is now AL 16 and 17 extends over an additional nine point hectares compared to the Prince's Foundation report, an increase of about 50%. So not only a vast increase in the number of dwellings, but over a much wider area, and again, it's going to impact on the character of Ascot. Thirdly, in the draft development brief, the Ascot Consortium suggests 109 dwellings for Ascot, the Ascot village part of AL16. That's unchanged from the submission version of the BLP and not a lot more than the neighborhood plan. But there are 191 dwellings on the Ascot green part of AL16 that's over double that proposed in the Prince's Foundation report. Now, 99 of those dwellings proposed for, were proposed in Ascot Green West at a density of 37 dwellings per hectare, way in excess of the Prince's Foundation report. And it's here where there is the greatest concentration of flatted development. And it's also where there is proposed to be the landmark tall building. So it, it's here at the junction of the High Street and the Station Hill for AL16, the conflict between Greenbelt release, housing numbers, excessive density, tall buildings, and the character for the area, not to say traffic considerations, collide most acutely. Now, from page 35 of the Ascot Consortium Developments Brief, there appear to be about 40 tree trees to be removed. Almost half of these are around the junction of the High Street and Station Hill. And that's an important gateway that con currently contributes to the green and leafy centre of Ascot. M many of those 40 trees are mature and all are subject to TPOs, and they make a very strong contribution to the character of Ascot. And it's notable on page 16 of the Prince's Foundation report 
that most of the mature trees were being retained with absolutely no suggestion of tall buildings or landmark buildings. That was also the clear intention in the neighborhood plan. The BLP and the de development, developers design guide, the trees have all gone from the Station Hill roundabout area and replaced with a tall ish. And we can debate whether it's a tall building fronting the high street and Station Hill. It's clear from paragraph 6.33 of the Ascot Consortium's transport study that a number of trees at the top of Station Hill will have to be lost. So again, reinforcing the link between character, number of dwellings and loss of trees. There was also a clear requirement for this junction and St George's Lane Winkfield Road Junction to be improved if the development of AL16 and or AL17 is allowed to go ahead. And these should be included in both the Ascot placemaking policy and the pro formas. I simply don't understand why this hasn't been addressed by the borough, either in the revised IDP or its re reply to your MIQs or even today. It's incomprehensible why the borough continues to prepare, pretend that there isn't a problem where the development acknowledges that it is. I'd like to emphasize that the neighborhood plan, again, sought to a sympathetic rejuvenation of what is now effectively AL16, so as to be in keeping with the character of the area. It recognized that to achieve this, the green belt boundary would need to be adjusted and potentially a small number of trees lost. What's now proposed is very different and is bound to result in an irreversible change to the center of Ascot. And it's not consistent with paragraph 155 of the, of, of the MPPF and is not sound. So what's the answer? Of course, Ascot can't be fossilized in ASPIC. However, there's wide acceptance that the neighborhood plan provided a way forward. I suggest that the answer is to go back to something that is much closer to what the community voted for in the neighborhood plan, or if not that, at least something in terms of total numbers for AL 16 and 17, that is no more than the submission version of the BLP, and that was about 300. To maintain the character of the area, there needs to be a substantial reduction in housing numbers, density, building height, and overall impact, especially at the top of Station Hill. And of course, this may have a knock-on effect on allocated housing. But if we've, as we've heard in previous sessions, there are a number of serious concerns about this and other aspects of the plan that may mean that this is less of a concern than some see it. This would enable the allocations for Ascot placemaking area, including AL 16 and 17, to be reduced and the character of Ascot maintained. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Dotfield, please. Thank you, ma'am. And um, as you'll be aware, it was our representations that raised the issue of separate allocations in relation to AL 16 and particularly the lands to the north and the south of the High Street. Um, we welcome the acknowledgement by the council, both in their statements at para 423.3 and in hearing sessions last week, that individual parts of of a site can come forward separately and feel that this addresses our position provided it's formally acknowledged. Um, to just say, I think we've put that one to bed, ma'am, as far as we're concerned. And um, we remain of the view that there's no need for an SPD to be proposed for the Ascot placemaking area and feel that the council's limited resources will be better used in other locations where there's no na made neighbourhood plan, which comprehensively sets out a vision and a requirement for development briefs, which will ensure development comes forward in a coordinated manner. For AL16 in particular, significant work has already been undertaken by the Neighbourhood Plan Group and the local community, dating back to 2012, and we remain concerned that an additional requirement for an SPD will add undue delay to a process which started many years ago. The draft development brief prepared by the consortium and submitted to the Council allows for differing parcels to come forward at different times, but within a set of overarching design objectives and contributing appropriately to infrastructure improvements and community facilities, such as the new retail space and the village square. This, in our view, fulfills the council's requirements for a coordinated approach, and there is no further requirement for anything additional. In relation to the highways works, just to touch on that quickly, the, there is general agreement between us and the council that roundabouts on Station Hill are the most appropriate form of junction um, and the work that the consortium's consultants did demonstrated that any other form of junction there wouldn't really work. Um, 
the detailed appraisal that we submitted with our statement shows this. It concluded that increasing the size of the roundabouts would further benefit the local highways network and reduce any congestion. But clearly, and I think I would concur with what the council are saying here, any work around that needs to take into account further work that's been done by the council and the WSP strategic highways model and dealt with at the application stage. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so in terms of the rest of this um, on this side, so I'm going to hear from Mr. Patterson and then I understand that Mr. Griffin would also like to speak. So I'll hear from Mr. Patterson, Mr. Griffin, and then I'm going to go back to the, the council because we will need to move on to the other side. So Mr. Patterson, please, and then Mr. Griffin. Thank you, ma'am. Um, just to say uh, I support what uh, Mr. Stockfield said. Um, the council statements are welcome, both on the SPD, not holding up development and also uh, discrete sites within the allocations can come forward as long as that's clearly captured within the wording of the policy which it isn't at the moment um, and just on that and again it just goes to this issue of the language of the existing policy I know what, what the council is trying to achieve but I think we, we do just need to pick up the wording so within uh, QP1C and also the allocation policy AL16 we use words such as holistic uh, and comprehensive development. Uh, and I think if we're dealing with a large allocation which straddles different character areas, um, and if we accept that sites can come forward at different times, these definitions, holistic and comprehensive development, I think need picked up and changed. I think I, 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 far be it for me to, to put words in the council's mouth, but perhaps if we talk about coordination, that those might be more appropriate words, coordinated and coordination um, are, 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 are more comfortable and align with the, uh, the council's revised intentions. Thank you. Mr. Griffin, please. Thank you, ma'am. I was having some difficulty drawing my uh, drawing attention to my interest to, have a, to say a few words. Let me just answer your first question or your question which you raised which was about uh, north and south of the high street. We, we support uh, it being viewed as one holistic area characterised with residential, retail, employment, community uses and public open space in the village centre. Uh, returning to a point which has been raised by um, uh, Ms Toombs and Mr Baker, which is to do with the concentration of development within the centre of Ascot. I don't need to go through the fact that uh, we've moved, moved more recently jumped from 300 units and we spiralled now to 431 within the centre of Basket. But I'd just like to pick up on uh, the council's response in 4.2.3 in there to the MIQs that you raised, which says, however, the amounts of development now proposed would make efficient use of land whilst protecting character and achieving place making. We, we challenge this statement about protecting character, uh, which is so important to us as residents, as these proposals would not change, just change character, but we actually believe would destroy character within the ASCA area. Uh, I don't plan to spend very much time on some of the points that I understand have been covered over extensively over the course of the last uh, two or three weeks or so, but I do share your concern, ma'am, where I think you were drawing attention a moment ago to the fact that we've got development breeds, we've got uh, uh, we've got place making, we've got the neighbourhood plan, we've got the local plan, and clearly we've got the MPBF, uh, and uh, and then also the SPD. And the concern I would just raise in terms of the SPT in relation to the development breeds, there's a really at best uh, there's a danger of duplicating value, and worse, it could be much worse in terms of ignoring value in terms of uh, what's already been consulted on and been extensively uh, worked on over the course of the last eight years or so. Um, that's not really what I want to say on that. I, and again, I don't plan to spend any time talking about the tall buildings as those have clearly been extensively covered, but I would like really to follow up on the point that Mr. Baker made just now, which was about density in the south side of the high street. Again, if we refer to the Princess Foundation Vision Report, page 17, it indicated that medium sized housing would be to the east, in other words, down towards St George's Lane, and larger sites with housing would be to the west. And then in something in the order of 24 to 28 housing units per, he per, uh, per hectare. 
Uh, that is after allowing for open space and a village square. The prime reason for the, the lesser density on the side, south side of the high street was to do with, and I quote, keep existing large trees and landscape. When we look at what's being promoted by, by landowners on the south side of the high street, adjacent to Station Hill, it is high density, four-story mixed-use buildings, contrary to the Princess Foundation's vision. Ascot Village, as we know, is a classic example of Victorian villages, and we seriously challenge why four to five story structures with flat roofs is consistent with its characterization. Uh, we do not regard five story blocks hard up against the high street as being a, a quote, 4.2, 4.212, a uh, quote, being a modest local landmark. Re returning to the trees, which is really, really important. The main reason in the Princess Foundation vision why housing on the south side of the high street was going to be lower density was because, as I, we said earlier on, the 60 special trees adjacent to Station Hill. Because of their age, size and condition, they are of exceptional biodiversity, cultural and heritage value. In fact, I would back those trees up against anything you might find in Windsor Forest. Substantial tree loss would result with the proposed developments to the west of the site and their loss would seriously harm the leafy character of the village. For these reasons, we do not agree with the council that important, and I quote, important protected trees that are of value to the area are not at risk. That's 4.20.4. Thank you, Mum. Thank you very much. Okay, let's go back to the um, council, please, and then we'll probably have a short break and then move on to the to the remaining sites. There's Thank you, Mum. Miss Buttram. Um, okay, I'll, I'll just say a few words and then I'll hand over to Mr. Beard to respond to the legal point you mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, just picking up on a couple of points, um, I think in terms of Miss Toomes um, and, and about a car park, you know, I, 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 I think it's about a balance. There's certainly no intention to remove all the car parking in, in, in the high street or anything like that. Um, I understand that this issue is being looked at uh, to some extent in, in some of the... Um, Ascot High Street uh, public realm improvement um, work study that's going on that uh, I think we're, we're, we're waiting to see whether whether LEP funding is available for those works but uh, uh, certainly no intention to, to remove all the car parking realize that that, 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 is, that is important um, in terms of cycle, cycle routes if, if that's the case sorry if that's the case and they obviously feel very strongly about it is there any harm in clarifying that we, we can certainly look we're, in the review of the pro formas, we, we can certainly look at, at that and, and whether or not we need to be more specific about parking. And, and I think the same point, point goes, as, as I mentioned, about uh, tr trees as well. We, could, we can have, a, have another look to see whether or not we can say more about protection of trees. So I appreciate that is, is of great concern to the, to the community. Um, and uh, apart from that, the only other point I wanted to just pick up on really was... Um, there was Mr. Uh, Patterson's uh, uh, comments about, about some of the terminology. Uh, he suggested coordination rather than holistic and comprehensive. And again, I think we can, we can, we can, we can ha have another look at that and, and see whether the terminology um, needs, needs any sort of refinement. But uh, um, the, other, the other specific yep. point was the community building. Yes, community building, again, Rather than answer that now, could could I could I perhaps uh, we, we we perhaps need a little time to to think about that? But again, it may be something we can pick up in the uh, pro forma review. Um, I don't think I was really any anything more to add to those points, um, but uh, um, just uh, one moment to see if there's anything else I could add. No, I think, I think that's all I'd like to say at the moment. I'll just hand over to Mr. Beard, if that's okay. Thank you. And thank you. Um, I think it's very important to make the point that under Section 70, Subsection 2 of the 1990 Act, the decision maker who comes to consider an application, whether it's the council or an inspector or the Secretary of State on appeal, obviously must have regard to the development plan so far as it's material 
to the the application uh, before before the decision makers. So there's two two aspects to think about. One is materiality, uh, and one is weight. And we know, of course, weight is always for the decision maker. Um, materiality and what the policy means is obviously a matter of law, ultimately for the courts. And uh, as I understand your question, uh, we're we're confident that that, that we understand that. Um, where there is inconsistency, it's a matter for the decision maker to 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 take account of that, and the law requires statutory um, provisions require decision maker uh, to uh, give precedence to the uh, later adopted document. But that's not what your question uh, was about. Your question, as I understood it, was uh, what happens otherwise when there's not necessarily inconsistency, but how should the decision maker read? Both plans together, and I think the important thing first to make uh, f- f- uh, first to keep in mind is that the development plan must be considered as, as a whole. So, in so far as the policies can be read together compatibly, they should be uh, so read. Um, and in that respect, it's always helpful. And you, you may think, and um, the council should do uh, should revisit the um, QP one supporting text to make clear how the um, QP1C policy and the relevant site pro forma um, uh, pro formas should be read having regard to the made neighbourhood plan um, on, on reflection. I think we think that that would be, it would be helpful certainly to supplement the, uh, the explanatory text to policy QP1C uh, to make that clear to assist the decision makers' um, uh, consideration of both uh, policies, uh, so both plans, um, uh, when decisions are made. Um, It's important, I think, for us to make the point here that um, whereas Mr. Mottrell has made the point a number of times, not least this morning, that, that that the borough local plan is not intended to override uh, the neighbourhood plan and the good work that's done there, it being made. But there is, as Mr. Gillespie said this morning, that very important, uh, very important key um, consideration that the change in emphasis in the borough local plan is to prov- is to require the delivery of new housing um, to meet local needs, uh, and it's it might well be the case that in the in, in the policy or and or the supporting text that that emphasis could be. A, made a little more clear um, by reference to the made lo- uh, neighbourhood plan. Um, but that also could be made clear. Uh, any difference in emphasis, and I'm thinking here, uh, I'm at risk about talk, talking about tall buildings, but buildings at height, any change in the context um, could be made clear also if there is a cha- an emphasis, a change in emphasis or a difference in emphasis between the borough local plan and the made neighbourhood plan in terms of um, plan development in the pro for site allocation pro formas, that could also be made clear in the sense that context should be seen having regard to the key priority of delivering new new housing. I hope that assists. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I think thank you, Mr. Beard. That, that's very that's very helpful. And um, there's obviously lots that I'm going to consider in relation to, to what's been said about Ascot over the over the sort of entirety of the examination. But I, but I certainly think um, that a, that a modification along those lines, which explains um, the relationship of the different layers of policy and how they should be read together, is certainly something I'm I'm pretty certain. I, I would I would be asking for um, perhaps the precise nature of, of of that I need to think a little bit more about but yes something uh, a note for, for you to note something along those lines of what Mr Beard has just said I think would be would be very helpful. Thank you. We'll do that, madam. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll we'll have a a break now until eleven thirty, and then we will come back and start on AL seventeen. Thank you.
Okay, so welcome back, everyone. And we'll move straight on to talk about site AL17, the Shorts Waste Transfer Station and Recycling Facility. Um, I have just this one question, which obviously arisen from um, criticisms made of the delivery trajectory by some of the other participants, I don't think, who are here today. Um, but is it realistic that delivery will commence in 2022-23, taking account of the remediation and reprofiling works which might be required? And then there's a modification to draw to your attention um, to the pro forma to address the Environment Agency's concerns about the requirements for sustainable urban, urban drainage systems. So there are my specific questions. If, if the council could answer those first, please, and then Again, if others wishing to speak in relation to AL17 could put up their hands in the meantime. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, starting with that first question about delivery, um, in the housing trajectory uh, within the proposed changes plan, it was estimated that AL17 uh, would commence delivery in 22-23 and be completed in 2024-25. So that's PS058. Um, a planning application for 131 dwellings was submitted in 2018, uh, but it is still awaiting determination. It is acknowledged that the site, which is a waste transfer station and recycling facility, may be contaminated. Um, and in addition, the existing waste facilities would need to be relocated. So uh, the council accepts that delivery in 2022 stroke 23 is optimistic uh, and we will re-examine the delivery time scales for this uh, site in the work that we are currently undertaking on the trajectory to ensure that that is realistic. Thank you. Um, very briefly on the second point uh, about the uh, uh, environment agency's concerns about the requirement for SUDS. I think we've, we've set out in, a, in, a, in a, our MIQ response that uh, we would be open uh, to an amendment to the pro forma for AL17 uh, to replace the SUDS bullet, uh, which is like the 18th bullet, with, with new wording along the lines that the environment agency uh, have suggested. Thank you. Thank you. That's all. Okay, others, please. Um, Ms. Toombs, please. Um, thank you. Uh, first, may I very briefly pick up on what Mr. Beard said earlier, just to be absolutely clear. Um, we understand that if policies, local plan and neighborhood plan are compatible, then the decision maker can take a view on how to interpret. But if they can be argued in any way to be incompatible, so in conflict, then the local plan as both the most recent and on the basis that these policies are defined as strategic, will directly override the neighborhood plan. Um, so we do welcome the idea of the supporting text, but we're, as far as we understand, if there is any opportunity to be, uh, for uh, them to be considered incompatible or conflicting, then the neighborhood plan is dead in the water. Um, regarding AR17, uh, local residents generally support uh, the develop, redevelopment of this site for the very simple reason that it would be delightful to get rid of all the skip lorries off our high street. Um, so uh, certainly there is no uh, widespread um, desire to retain that site in its current use. Um, however, it is a PDL in Greenbelt and in accordance with the neighborhood plan in our view should remain in Greenbelt and be re redeveloped in accordance with the Greenbelt policy. Uh, the boundary around AL16 would be entirely defensible as a green belt boundary, so there is no reason there to not to. Um, as has been said, there is a planning application at an advanced stage awaiting determination, which is an outline application for 131 dwellings and access. Um, our concern is that releasing the land from green belt could potentially give rise to uh, a, another future application for yet further increases uh, in the quantum of development, which in our view, as you know, is too high already. Um, the site remains part of the Ascot Center placemaking area and the community would feel very, frankly betrayed if the current or any future application did not include contributions to the necessary public realm improvements at Ascot High Street as set out indeed in the performer. It is a re performer requirement, but bearing in mind this may be determined before the plan is adopted, uh, that is a concern. 
Um, specifically on policy wording, I won't repeat myself on trees and the usual. Uh, I'd like to register full support for bullet seven regarding pedestrian and cycle links to South Ascot, the station and the high street, and also bullet 12 regarding the public right of way on St. George's Lane. Uh, the likelihood is that it's St. George's Lane that would become the pedestrian cycle link, um, but nonetheless, I think both bullet points are valid. And then, as I said, crucially, the last but one bullet point about AL17 making a financial contribution towards the high street realm improvements. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Baker, please. Sorry, technology problems. Um, we've heard quite a lot this morning about roundabouts and how some think they should be left the planning application stage. Uh, we heard last week from the representative for Shorts that they expected to receive outline planning permission by the end of the year. Um, I can't see anything in the documents submitted for the outline planning application that suggests a new roundabout at St George's Lane, Wingfield Road, junction with the High Street. You know, uh, I feel they should be. It would be a complete travesty for the borough to make a decision on this application now. It would prejudge your conclusions and effectively new to the examination so far as Ascot placemaking is concerned. I'll save the borough and others from saying that rules are rules by observing that it also owes obligations to its residents and the community, not to act in a way as to frustrate public challenge in this examination. Thank you. Thank you. Griffin, I'm just checking. I noticed your hand went up and went back down again. Um, has, have others made your point or is it a, a technical glitch? Just checking that Mr. Griffin doesn't want to say anything. Yes, if I may, I just uh, lost connection for a moment. It was it we're still talking about uh, uh, So, Just two points, if I may. Uh, first of all, to do with the um, the tra trajectory and the uh, allocations for the sites. Uh, I, I hear that uh, uh, the calculation of one hundred and thirty one was based on the um, based on the HeLa. I would just like to make a couple of points. If we go back to twenty fourteen and the um, the uh, preferred options consultation. That the figure at that time was 60. Uh, in the cabinet papers on the 26th of February the following year, it was 65. But we've morphed to a figure now, 131, which seems to be, uh, regardless of the heat, seems to be an extraordinary increase in the amount of housing. The other point I'd like to make is that it is a greenbelt site. Uh, some of it is um, previously developed in terms of buildings. Some of it is previously developed in terms of hard standing. Uh, and the rest of it is uh, clearly is green field. But I'd just like to point out that in terms of green belt policy, uh, openness is a key characteristic of uh, green belt. And whilst hard standing may not impact openness, certainly two story houses will. And I just wonder whether that was a factor in terms of how the HeLa looked at the calculation for the, uh, the, uh, the amount of housing, the allocations for this particular site. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Okay, Ms. Charles, please. Thank you, ma'am. Um, just to pick up quickly um, on Mr. Baker's point, um, the planning application does propose some fairly limited, but some improvements to the Winkfield Road at roundabout, the details of which are part of that application. Um, just then coming back to um, the borough local plan, Shorts made a number of suggested changes to policy AL17 in their representations to the proposed changes. Um, you will have those in front of you. Um, whilst you've not raised any specific questions, I would welcome the opportunity uh, fairly briefly just to pick up on um, a couple of those points. Um, there are similar issues here on this site to, or similar wording actually, to 
um, policy AL17, where it refers to comprehensive development and holistic development. Um, and just to say, I support the approach on the suggestions put forward by Mr. Patterson and Ms. Duckfield um, about the suggested removal of those words and replacement, perhaps with something uh, more appropriate, perhaps uh, coordinated or, or effective, something um, similar. Um, I just also want to um, raise the point around biodiversity. There's a point um, within the draft policy relating to improvements to Ascot Wood. Um, our preference actually is that that policy is deleted, not um, so that we don't have to provide that improvement, but there is obviously a national requirement um, to demonstrate net biodiversity gain set out in the um, MPPF. Um, and indeed the planning application achieves net biodiversity gain and is therefore consistent. Um, I therefore think that the that particular clause, which is bullet point six, relating to biodiversity of the wider area, including Nascot Wood, is perhaps unnecessary. But just on that point, because I hear this quite a lot, we've talked earlier about um, sort of repetition and whether that's unsound or whatever, but what, why are you concerned about something being in there that you know you comply with? Um, I think because it's repetition and because there is obviously a, a national requirement um, to provide biodiversity gain, I think it's the specific requirement um, to look at improvements to the wider area, including Ascot Wood. It's not, it's not, it's not a significant concern to us. I just think it's something that um, is deemed unnecessary. Okay, thank you. Um, just picking up on bullet point seven, which relates to pedestrian and cycle links, we've suggested some um, minor change um, to the wording there. Um, our proposal, including our application, um, does make some important linkages um, between um, the station and the high street and indeed the AL16 site, which we abut. Um, but the, so I just think it's, it's a slightly suggested change into the wording to facilitate those future connections uh, rather than to provide them, because we obviously can't connect um, all the way through from one site to the other, but it's making sure that we facilitate them without any degree of ransom. Um, there's a similar point actually on the bus infrastructure um, in bullet points eight and 10. The, um, the wording um, suggests appropriate provision of new bus stop infrastructure um, and in improvements. Again, we support um, the need, we support um, bus provision um, generally, although recognise recognised comments made by others um, that car travel is also important. But we just, we don't suggest that's removed, but we have suggested some slight wording um, to remove the, the point about appropriate provision of bus infrastructure, um, but to retain the requirement to ensure that the development is well served by public transport. Just checking. And then there was a point around affordable housing and um, with the benefit of um, a planning application, this matter in particular has been looked at um, in considerable detail um, and has been subject to viability. But just to ensure some consistency um, between um, the application process and the policy um, as drafted, um, we suggest that rather than it referring to at least 30% affordable housing, it is a requirement to provide affordable housing um, subject to viability considerations and that requirement of viability considerations particularly important in this respect this is a complex site that requires remediation and land stabilization in order to deliver um, an appropriate and successful scheme so again we've set out in our proposed changes reps how how we suggest we do that my final point on the um, the clauses in particular relate to drainage there are requirements in this and some of the other policies uh, requiring appropriate and uh, sustainable drainage solutions. Um, this site is um, a former landfill site, and um, so there are particular challenges associated with drainage. But that aside, there's always an expectation and a requirement um, to provide the most appropriate drainage solution relative to the site. So again, uh, whilst not a drop dead point for us, um, I don't believe that it's necessary to include these points around drainage within this particular site pro forma, or indeed any other site pro forma, it's perhaps more a general requirement for any development coming forward, particularly any major development to come forward that, um, that looks at sustainable drainage solutions. Those are my points really in relation to uh, the clauses. Just to come back to you um, on your particular question um, around timescales, 
As others have said, the application was submitted in March um, 2018. Significant time has passed, but I will say that not, no time has been lost. Um, and there's been a lot of work being done by the applicant, um, but also the council's officers, particularly the planning officer, but also the other officers as well. Um, and we've now got to a point where all technical issues um, are agreed and we are working positively towards um, a panel date. Subject to a positive outcome of that, um, there is a, a legal agreement to be prepared. We've agreed in principle the heads of terms for that, so I would hope it's a relatively straightforward um, process to get that Section 106 signed in the early part of next year. It is, of course, an outline planning application, despite significant effort that's been put into uh, master planning and the technical matters. Um, the draft conditions will require a reserve matters application to be submitted within three years. Now, that sort of takes us to early 2024, and it sort of sets a long stop date um, on a reserve matters application. We'd certainly hope that a reserve matters application would come forward much sooner than that. A lot of work has been done um, on the housing layout, um, although this is not being approved by the outline planning application. And the speed at which we can secure reserve matters planning permission will very much depend on how quickly we can agree the technical matters and the design of the homes on what is quite a complicated and clearly very important site. In addition to securing reserve matters approval, Shorts Group also re need to relocate their business. It's possible that this can happen concurrently with the determination of the reserve matters application. The outline planning application demonstrates how the temporary relocation can take place um, of those existing waste facilities. This could therefore happen fairly quickly, but it will be a disruption to the business and therefore does need to be managed and coordinated very carefully. Therefore, whilst the timescale of 2022-23 um, is possible, it is optimistic. Achieving the timescales um, will benefit from a close and positive working relationship between Shorts Group and the Council, including, including um, an expedient signing of the Section 106 agreement, and a positive working um, engagement with stakeholders, including the neighbourhood plan group, the parish council, um, and other stakeholders and neighbouring um, landowners. That was my point really on, on timescales. Just to finish on your final point around um, the EA response, given the existing ground conditions through the application process, the Environment Agency have accepted um, that the drainage strategy for the new housing development can't involve the use of subs. Instead, there is a surface water drainage strategy, which is now um, agreed in principle with the Environment Agency. Shorts therefore support the Council's proposed amendment to replace the requirement for SUDS in respect of AL17 um, to demonstrate that the management of surface water drainage will not harm, harm groundwater quality. Those are all my points, Mom. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, a very brief point from Miss Toombs before we um, go back to the council because we need to move on to the other sites as well. Um, thank you. M mine is a, more of a question, in fact, from Miss Charles because I wasn't clear from what she said whether uh, the St George's Lane uh, bullet point, kind of the, uh, as a public right of way, uh, is one that she has suggested alternative wording for. Because St George's Lane as a public right of way is to us the main expectation for how. Uh, the uh, pedestrian and cycle routes to South Ascot will be delivered. Um, so it was uh, just uh, something that was unclear. Do you want to answer very briefly, Ms. Charles, because obviously I can look at that. Yeah, just very briefly, um, our suggested change, rather than what is currently to maintain and enhance the public right of way on St George's Lane, um, our suggested change is to make an appropriate contribution towards improvements to the public right of way on St George's Lane. Um, just to be just to be clear, um, St George's Lane has almost two component parts to it. There's the part where you can drive down, and it has a sort of formal um, footway, um, and then there's part which is effectively a footpath, um, which there is no vehicle access to. Um, so it's the it's the unpaved element really that we're looking at contribution to. The planning application itself does 
propose improvements to the highway element um, to improve connectivity up to London Road. Ms. Teams, I hope that clarifies points. Um, it clarifies it, but dismays us because clearly St George's Lane as a public highway piece is, is obvious, but the actual connectivity for pedestrians and cyclists from the site to South Ascot can only be delivered by the uh, non-vehicle path that currently exists. And that is kind of a fundamental requirement and indeed a fundamental requirement, um, I think, in, in the neighbourhood plan. Okay, we're, we're going to move on. Yeah. Move on. Thank you. So if we can, um, if, if, if the council wants to comment on anything you've heard there, and then we'll turn to AL18. Thank you. Um, just a couple of points very, very briefly, really. Um, I think uh, we, we certainly welcome uh, Ms. Toombs' general support for uh, the, 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 the allocation pro forma. Um, and uh, Mr. Griffin uh, made a couple of points about Greenbelt, but obviously uh, we're proposing to remove this site from the Greenbelt. But in terms of the current planning application, I understand that the promoters are obviously having to demonstrate very special circumstances uh, uh, in, as, as, the, as, the, as the local plan has not yet been adopted. Um, and I think just in terms of um, Ms. Childs's various points about the pro forma, I think uh, to, to repeat what I said earlier, really, we will, we will think carefully about all of those comments and about whether uh, changes should be made to the uh, wording of the pro forma and the bullet points to, to, to address uh, some of those uh, on, on, on that point, Mr. Mottrell, I think we sort of, there are some things We've obviously flagged up through the um, examination that needs to be looked at in a sort of consistent way, but I don't think you necessarily should um, take the review of the pro forma to sort of end up, you know, rewriting the whole thing again. I mean, so there, there are categories of things that have come up um, that obviously we need to, that, that we've discussed and that we've sort of agreed need to be looked at for consistency purposes. Um, but uh, this isn't the time to sort of rewrite everything again. Yes, I, I take that point. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. OK, we're, get, we're going to move on to AL18. I know a couple of hands keep going up, but um, I have until now been quite strict, I think, about saying only one go each. And I've often finished early. So I've had uh, we've had a couple of little goes today, but we are we are sort of perhaps running short on time now to get through. And there's quite a lot of important sites. I want to get on particularly as well at the end to AL32 and allow time for that. So. Within reason, I'm going to stick to saying, try to say all that you want to say. I know it's always tempting to come back, but I'll take account of all the points that are raised and I'll have to consider them all in, in the round. Um, so AL18 now, please. If anyone, I have no specific questions. I don't want to hear about tall buildings again, um, but I'm happy for if you raise your hand, if you want to speak on. OK, Mr. Griffin, I've got you. Anyone else want to raise their hand to speak on AL18, but be prepared to say it only once. No, I'm going to be pleased to say it's nothing to do with tall buildings. Uh, it's just a point of information which is to do with the discussion that's been taking place concerning development briefs, uh, pro formers, uh, SPDs and the like. So I'd just like to point out, and this also applies to the next application, AL, or the next allocation, AL19, which is that in both cases, a development brief will be required to comply with policy H1 in the neighbourhood plan that requires any site which is, has proposals for 10 or more uh, dwellings in 0.4 of a hectare or more does require a development brief. So I just draw to your attention that. Thank you. Ms. Toombs, please. Uh, we have one suggestion uh, other than what has already been covered. The ninth bullet point on improvements to the quality of the public realm at the entrance to the station we suggest you'd have the words and function added because as far as the station access is concerned, the functionality of it is as important, um, is specifically important, not just a general quality. Thank you. Anyone else? No. Okay, thank you. Um, back to the council. Um, thank, thank you, ma'am. Um, I, I wasn't going to say anything on the um, uh, on that particular allocation AL eighteen, um, but I'm happy, obviously, to, to move on to to AL nineteen if if that's where we're at. Yes, please. Okay. Okay, so Englemere Lodge. 
uh, asking about the capacity of the site, whether 10 units is justified. Um, and we, we, so the suitability and deliverability of Englemere Lodge was, was considered through the HELAR process. And it was concluded that due to constraints such as protected trees uh, covering about half the site um, and the prevailing character that approximately 10 units would be appropriate, um, this would uh, equate to uh, a density of about 30 dwellings per hectare on the, the deliverable part of the site. Uh, we know that the site promoter considers that up to 45 uh, dwellings could be delivered on the site. Um, but no capacity plan has been provided in support. Um, at the Regulation 19 stage, um, CBRE promoted the Englemere Lodge site. And in their submissions, they included a site capacity assessment. Uh, this showed a flatted scheme fronting the northern and northwest, northwestern boundaries of the site with trees along the southeastern boundary protected. And the capacity plan showed a, a four story scheme accommodating 20 units uh, with a, a mix of one, two, three and four bedroom flats. Um, the surrounding context for this site is uh, between three and four and a half story development, I understand. Um, so as, as with other sites, site allocations, uh, the council has sought to take a realistic but conservative approach to the estimated site capacity. However, on further reflection, the proposed estimated capacity is probably too conservative and the council would therefore like to propose uh, a modification to increase the estimated capacity for this site to uh, about 20 units. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Okay, let's hear from um, Mr. Fitzpatrick. Thank you, ma'am. Um, we, ha we have carried out a full tree survey here um, and various feasibility studies, uh, clearly 10 units. So Mr. Fitzpatrick, I can't see you. I can hear you, but I can't see you. Just turn your camera on. Um, I'm afraid my connection is... Okay, no problem. Carry on, I can hear you. Oh, here we go. Okay, the, um, we, we carried out a full tree survey and uh, various feasibility studies. Clearly, 10 units will struggle to work financially, as the council now seem to accept. Um, and uh, we believe that with sympathetic architecture and a combination of apartments and housing, we can deliver a better use of the land while respecting the existing tree layout um, in, in what is a, a, a highly sustainable location. Thank you. And what do you what do you think of the proposal that you've just heard from the council? Well, it's uh, it's very good news for us. Um, it's certainly moving in the right direction. And I think if we get the opportunity to sit down with the council and show them some sketches for the combination of apartments and housing, I think we could uh, reach agreement fairly quickly. Thank you. Let's hear from others then. Um, Miss Toombs, please. Um, thank you. Uh, our starting point is that this site should not be proposed uh, for release from the Green Belt. Um, and if one looks at the Green Belt uh, boundaries uh, from on high, it seems to be logical. Um, there are a large number of mature trees, uh, which the Council quite correctly uh, states should be retained. Uh, we're also kind of uh, interested in how readily the Council is willing to consider increasing site capacity. Um, but never really willing to consider uh, decreasing it in, in any way, uh, even though saying considerations of trees, green belt and so on kind of uh, may apply. But um, 
there's no question in our mind that this is not a site that should be released from Greenbelt. If there is an argument for redeveloping the previously developed uh, element of it, then so be it. Thank you. Mr. Baker. Thank you. Um, I explained last week why I felt this site should remain in the green belt. A development of 10 dwellings might be able to be justified under existing green belt policy if sympathetically done with the protected trees retained in appropriate screening. Anything more would be out of keeping with the character of the area. And this site west of the A322 is in a very low density area and in the green belt. The site on the wrong side of the A322 for any larger density. And I'd suggest it should never have been included in the Ascot strategic placemaking area. It is an important site on a junction for those arriving in Ascot. And even if the green and leaf, leafy appearance can't be enhanced, it should at least be maintained. I certainly don't support the increase to 20 units. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, if we come back briefly to the council, but from my perspective, obviously, it's perhaps something I, I need to um, consider once I've seen it on the ground. Um, so, Mr. Mottrell? Uh, well, I don't really think I've got anything to add to what I said earlier, to be honest. Thank you. Okay. Let's, let's move on then to Heatherwood Hospital. Hello, ma'am, I'll be picking this one up. Oh, hello there, yep. thank you. The planning application for the site was submitted on the basis of 250 dwellings, but prior to its determination, this figure was reduced to 230 dwellings. The council agrees that the capacity of AL20 should be reduced from 250 units down to 230 in order to reflect the existing planning permission. Thank you. In response to the second question, the trajectory for the proposed changes plan estimates that the first 25 dwellings would be completed in 21 to 22, with the final completions in 24 to 25. The council understands that construction of the hospital building is well advanced with anticipated completion in summer 21, upon which the redevelopment of the existing hospital can begin subject to a reserved matters application. The council will look again at the delivery dates for this site in its review of the housing trajectory for the additional hearing session on 9th of December. Thank you. Thank you. And then there's this question of the um, the inclusion of or not of the Sang land in, in, in the in the site. Yep. As explained in the council's response to MIQ 11.4.27, the site boundary, as shown in the AL20 Performa, is tightly drawn around the area proposed for housing and office development within the planning application. The application, on the other hand, was based on a boundary that also included the land that will be used for the relocated hospital and the proposed SANG. As the SANG and the relocated hospital are necessary to deliver the residential development, the council now considers that it would be appropriate for these to be included within the allocation AL20 boundary. This would ensure consistency between the planning application and the allocation and would not have any negative implications. The council considers that doing so is necessary for soundness. Would you like me to move on to the next bullet point as well, ma'am? Yes, please. Thank you. As explained in our response to MIQ 11.4.28 in the submission plan, it was proposed to remove the existing Heatherwood Hospital campus, including ancillary built development at Brook Avenue from the Greenbelt. This was because the Edge of Settlement Analysis 2016 Part 1, reference SD underscore 018, assessed this parcel of land, A3, as performing least well against the purposes of the Greenbelt. 
the edge of settlement analysis part two reference SD underscore zero one nine further assess this parcel in terms of its constraints, opportunities and delivery. In the in the in that the application has been approved and very special circumstances were successfully demonstrated. As such, there is no longer any need to remove it from the green belt. This is consistent with other allocations within the green belt where development proposals have been approved on the basis of very special circumstances, such as AL35 Sunningdale Park, as well as sites not in the plan that were approved under VSC, such as Ascot Racecourse Grandstand. The retention of the site within the green belt is justified and, further, and should further development proposals come forward, they can be assessed against the provisions set out in paragraphs 88 and 89 of the MPPF. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's hear from others, and then I'll perhaps just come back on a couple of those points. Ms. Toombs, please. Uh, it may come as a little bit of a shock, but overall, we support the council's position. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and Mr. Baker. Uh, and so do I. Um, and just to add that uh, it seems to me that exceptional circumstances don't exist for its removal from the Green Belt. As we discussed last week, tidying up exercises are not sufficient. And removing the site from the Green Belt will leave an inconsistent Green Belt boundary. And this is important because at present the Green Belt extends east and west for distances in excess of a mile. <coughs> removal would result in an incongruous boundary and the existing boundaries of the roads are much clearer physical features. I'd also say that if Heatherwood was to be taken out of the Green Belt, there'd be an increased pressure on neighbouring sites, uh, including AL19. So, thank you. Thank you. generally happy with all of that. I just wonder whether you could say a little bit more about why it's necessary to increase the size of the allocation, um, given that planning permissions, obviously already, it's not going to, leaving it as it is, isn't going to prevent the relocation of the hospital and the SANG. Why is it that you feel it would? it's important to include that area within the boundary and if you do do that is the pro forma as it stands sufficient um, okay uh, i think first first point really is that uh, the permission is outline only so there are still reserve matters to determine um, so that would be one one good reason um, i think another good reason another reason was that as so i understand Sorry. The so permission is outlined for what? Because, but, sorry, because the, the hospital and the SANG, I've, I've made a note, says that they have planning permission and they're being constructed. Yes, I think it was actually, it was, actually a, it was a hybrid ap application, I believe. So some parts were outlined and some were full. Um, and uh, yes, I, 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 I un I'd have to double check to see whether the housing has actually commenced. I, I, we can, we can, um, Mr. Beard can, um, can, can answer that. But uh, uh, I think, I think the, the hospital itself, the hospital itself uh, is, is now being built uh, further to the south, I think, of where, where it was originally anticipated to be, the new hospital, that is. Um, mm -hmm. And, and uh, that would, would for us make more sense if uh, that was all within the uh, boundary, a uh, red line boundary, if you like. I'll pass it over. Can I, can I just pass to Mr. Beard to, to add to what I just said? Madam, yes. Um, just just in, in preparing for this um, item, we had a look at the close look at the planning permission. Now, the application was a hybrid application, um, a detailed component of the application related to the relocated hospital. And that is um, uh, the conditions have been discharged in respect of that. Um, However, in relation to the development of the subject of the allocation as it is shown on 
uh, AL20 uh, in the proposed changes plan. That was uh, an outline application, although uh, many of the matters that could be reserved were not reserved. So there was detailed layouts um, and um, uh, massing and, and, and the like. Um, but there are some matters reserved, including landscaping, as, as I understand it. So um, there remains the possibility, whether or not it's likely is a separate question, there remains the possibility that a, a developer could come forward with a, uh, applying for planning permission for something different on the uh, the allocated site as it presently exists. And we, we consider it's necessary as a result of that, given that the planning application was for up to 250 uh, new homes, that planning permission was granted subject to the detailed plans, that there's still scope potentially um, for, a, for a, another application to come forward for more than 230 homes. And uh, in any event, if any application were to come forward, it's important to include the Sangland to make very clear um, uh, should there, in that eventuality, um, the, the, the purpose of the uh, the purpose of the allocation being drawn more widely. We take the point, of course, that um, it, 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 it will be necessary for us to review the adequacy, I think, of the pro forma in those circumstances. And I wonder if in those circumstances, it would be appropriate for us to write you a little note um, to, to make our position clear. I think, I think that would be helpful. I, I don't know whether, I, whether this is a, a reasonable concern or not, but if, if on the basis that you could get an application for more than 230 homes, up to 250, if you increase the size of the allocation, are you then potentially allowing the development to spread further? And is that, would that be an can, yeah. consequence? I think- But then I'm not sure I the other people it would, um, they feel differently. Uh, quite possibly. Um, uh, of course, if, if we were to do this, it would be a, a main modification and the and the holder of the planning permission, the promoter of the site, if you like, would have the opportunity to um, uh, to respond uh, at the main mods, modifications um, consultation stage. But uh, I absolutely take your point that if we, if we broaden the allocation site, the pro forma would have to make clear that any any development, um, any development the likes of which is 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 considered within the AL twenty site allocation pro forma, should be restricted to that um, uh, to to the uh, red line area uh, uh, that has already got the benefit of planning permission. Of course, then it would be open to any developer if they thought it appropriate. Uh, to apply for planning permission on a wider site, but then it wouldn't necessarily be in accordance with, um, uh, such a proposal wouldn't necessarily be in accordance with the development plan, which is an important point having regard to the fact that it will be in the green belt. Thank you. Okay, perhaps, I, perhaps if you do prepare that, prepare that note, that would be, that would be, useful. thank you very much. Okay. So having having panicked about the time earlier, thank you. Thank you for being brief. We've now we can now move on to AL 32 um, Sandridge House with, with plenty of time. And there, there's quite a lot of um, points perhaps to consider there. Um, I was going to perhaps, as you can all see what my, my questions are, if he'd, if he'd like to, now he's been here for quite a long time, hasn't made a contribution. I wonder whether Mr. Barnett might like to Speak first. Mr. Barnett here, I've got that one. Thank you. Thank you, Ma'am. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to speak as a local resident and on behalf of uh, other local residents uh, neighbouring the site. Um, in terms of your first question on the significance of Sandridge House as a non designated heritage asset. Um, we consider it, it should be considered as high significance, both for its historic and architectural interest and should be retained and conserved in a manner appropriate to that significance. Um, if I focus on the detail, in terms of historic interest, um, that includes association to important local and national figures and events. It's representative of 19th century Victorian villas which have increasing rarity in Ascot as others have been lost through, to, through development. 
and it's played a key role in the social history of Ascot. Now, all of that is the subject of a 7,000 word history and architecture report that was submitted to Historic England, but I won't go through all of that, but some summary highlights just to add some color to the historic interest. Um, it was built between 1864 and 1869 as the residence for Reverend Edward Barnard Anger. He was the curate of the neighboring grade two listed All Saints Church. It was subsequently in the 1880s and 1890s visited by gentry during the racing season and Ascot week as covered in the press and was home to Lady Frances Hawk. So it's one of the few remaining examples of Ascot's Victorian villas enjoyed by high society. It was subsequently home to the internationally acclaimed Victorian explorer, Arthur Mountainane Jefferson, who was the right-hand man to Sir Henry Morton Stanley and Jefferson died at the site. Um, later um, in the First World War, it became the Ascot Military Hospital from April 1917, when the grandstand at Ascot Racecourse was no longer able to cope with um, the wounded. And in that capacity, it was served by Canadian nurses from the voluntary aid detachment during the First World War, playing its, uh, its role in the international war effort. Um, and then subsequently, Queen Victoria's granddaughter, Princess uh, Marie Louise, opened Sandridge House as a children's home following the Second World War. Uh, and the royal family was directly involved in the activities at the site. So as you can see, it has a very rich historic um, interest. In terms of architectural interest, um, it has a uh, strong aesthetic value, retaining the integrity of many features of merit, which are high on the list of priority architecture to be preserved in England um, and has strong examples of local styles. And Historic England has noted that it has group value with the grade two listed All Saints Church. Um, just a little bit of detail on the architecture. It was built in the Gothic revival style which includes gable ends with decorative barge boards, decorative chimney stacks, overhanging eaves, polychromatic brickwork. It is a rich example of, of multiple um, Gothic revival uh, features. Um, it also has strong examples of architectural vernacular details, such as pointed relieving arches above the windows and herringbone bond brick infills. Uh, and finally, um, it has many examples of 1860s building materials, including uh, a Welsh slate roof, uh, terracotta decorative ridge tiles and roof finials, and I could go on, but it has a, a many examples of architectural details. Historic England, uh, in their report 773388, noted that Sandridge House um, has a degree of local interest, and also in their letter to this examination, you'll be aware, um, they noted that Sandridge House is considered a non-designated heritage asset, and the building should be retained and conserved in a manner appropriate to that significance. I'd also add, in terms of its significance, significance the, um, the response letter that RBWM's own conservation officer wrote uh, in response to the planning application 19 stroke 01701 stroke full. Uh, and I quote, the removal of Sandridge House would remove one of the few historic buildings remaining in this area of Ascot and in the setting of All Saints Church. Once a town characterized by its ambitious villas used by the highest of society during racing season, Ascot has seen many of its residential properties replaced. Those that remain have an arguably higher significance due to this loss. We would agree. We, fight, we believe it is highly significant, certainly for the local history and for the setting of the church. Um, I'll carry on if it's okay to talk about um, your second bullet point about specific links to the adjacent listed church and contribution to its setting. If you carry on and say everything that you wanted to say, I think. Yes, that absolutely. Um, so it, it's clear there are direct links to All Saints Church and it's formed part of the setting of that grade two listed building for over 150 years. As I mentioned earlier, um, Sandridge House was built for the curate of the church. He was curate between 1867 and 1891. Um, it was actually funded by an ecclesiastical commission grant that was granted in July 1868 that paid an annuity for the land rent and a capital sum for the construction of the building. So it was um, at least part funded by the church. 
Um, and it is the only one of three original houses for the clergy of that church that is surviving. The other two have been lost. So it's um, the one remaining link to the history of the church. Um, as I mentioned, Historic England um, consider that uh, the building has group value with the church and noted that in their report. I'd also highlight that the church community um, very strongly consider Sandridge House to be part of the setting of the church. Um, you'll have received the letter from the parochial church council from July in response to this examination stating that. Um, but I would also highlight that of the over 70 objections to planning application 19 stroke 01701 stroke full, over half of those objections were from members of the congregation of the church opposing the impact on their experience of the setting of the church. Um, and I would also highlight the words again of RBWM's um, conservation officer in response to that same planning application where she said, this set of buildings uh, can be considered as part of the immediate and wider setting of the listed building. The setting of All Saints Church has already been harmed significantly due to the demolition of the rectory and Englemere Hill. Those are the two other houses for the clergy that have been lost. And by demolishing Sandridge House, this will sever the last link that All Saints Church has to its historic setting. Um, she also said the loss of the existing building would be objected to as it would cause less than substantial harm to the significance of the listed building. Uh, and it would be the loss of a non-designated heritage asset, which positively contributes to the understanding of the history of the listed building and the area. So I think it's clear that there are very, very strong links to that grade two listed church. Um, if I carry on to your, um, your other questions that you raise uh, in terms of, does the site occupy a transitional position between areas of higher and lower density and also to the character, your, your points about the character of the area. Um, look, I think on reflection, there's a risk of a, of a grave mistake being made here. This site is absolutely not a transitional position. It is very clear, there's a very clear definition of its townscape. And that's actually been previously reported on by the planning inspectorate. So if we look at um, the 2010 RBWM townscape assessment, um, it very clearly states, um, and it's, it's on the map in great detail, that Sandridge House is in the executive residential escape, estates townscape, which is characterized as low density residential suburbs. Um, built form is suburban style detached two-story houses in large organic plots, quiet and tranquil environment, often intensely private in character. Uh, and in terms of development guidance, the, uh, that townscape suggested that that should reflect the existing building heights and massing. Buildings should typically be the, in the order of two or two and a half stories high. Next door to that townscape um, and next door to uh, Sandridge House is Grand Regency Heights which is in a very different townscape according to that 2010 townscape assessment, which is the post-war residential flats townscape, described as the scale of built development is large. Buildings are typically three to five stories. And I know we don't want to talk about building heights, but fundamentally different from Sandridge House. Um, if I just refer back, I mentioned it just a second ago, but if I refer to the um, planning inspectorate's commentary on this, in the appeal decision from June, 2000, which was the appeal decision on Grand Regency Heights being built. The planning inspectorate referred to Grand Regency Heights as a landmark building, in other words, a one-off, um, and said Grand Regency Heights is seen in the context of the Heatherwood roundabout and land uses to the southeast, in other words, away from Sandridge House. And it actually mentioned Sandridge House. It said, in contrast, the established residential character of North Ascot to the northwest Developments are domestic in scale and one or two storeys in height. Examples are the Sandridge House nursing home. There are no nearby flats or multi-storey residences. So the planning inspector at the time was absolutely clear that the Sandridge House site is distinct and completely separate from the Grand Regency Heights landmark building. And as you know, the neighborhood plan, uh, and I know you had a question about the neighborhood plan and its implications for the Sandridge House um, building. The neighborhood plan is very clear on uh, requirements for respecting the townscape. So 
Uh, DG 1.1 in the neighborhood plan says development proposals should respond positively to the local townscape. Development proposals should use the RBWM townscape assessment report. Um, and DG 1.2 gets even more specific and says in townscape assessment zones, including executive residential estates, which is where Sandridge House is, residential development should comprise low or very low density developments of detached houses. This policy shall apply even in areas where these zones have other types of dwellings may exist. So it's very clear it is not a transitional site. It is distinctly in the executive residential estates townscape. And just to, just to finish off, I just wanted to delve into some of the numbers um, that are implied. And I've talked a little bit about the character of, the, of, the, of those townscapes, um, but just looking at some of the, the numbers of the proposal. So Sandridge House being in the executive residential estates, um, the density of that area was reported again in the planning inspectorate's appeal decision of June 2000. The density of the area that Sandridge House is in was reported as 12 uh, dwellings per hectare. And on the size of the Sandridge House site, that implies appropriate development would be six dwellings on the site. Now, if we look at RBWM's um, proposals and the, the densities associated with that, in the Gila at 25 dwellings, that implies 55 dwellings per hectare, but also in the revised proposal of retaining the current building and reducing the number of dwellings to 20 dwellings, that would still be 44 dwellings per hectare versus the land that Sandridge House is currently on in the neighboring properties at 12 dwellings per hectare. Now, if we look at um, Grand Regency Heights in contrast, which as I said, is on a very different townscape, that's at 50 cell, 57 dwellings per hectare, which is almost the same as the healer for Sandridge House of 55. Um, but if, it, if we look at the effective density, because the Sandridge House site um, has protected trees on it, and particularly the specimen trees have root protection areas, it means that only about two thirds of the site is developable, developable so about a third of a hectare. So that implies a density proposed under the council's proposals of 76 dwellings per hectare. Now, if you compare that to the density of Grand Regency Heights on its developable area, because there's a, there's a boundary area, it's not been developed, that's at 71. So the proposals are actually for a higher density at Sandridge than Grand Regency Heights, even though Grand Regency Heights is a landmark building in a very different townscape. Um, and to add to that, in terms of impact on the character of the area, it should be noted, and if you visit the site, you'll, you'll see this, that the land that Sandridge House occupies is substantially higher than both Jeffers Ride and All Saints Church that would lead to an overbearing development at the sort of densities that are being proposed under the council's plans. And that was one of the main reasons why the previous planning application was rejected because of the impact on the character of the area. So in summary, um, it's our belief that Sandridge House should be retained and conserved in a manner appropriate to its significance. We agree with both the council on that and with Historic England, but we would add that appropriate density should reflect the executive residential estates townscape of 12 dwellings per hectare, which implies six dwellings on the site. That concludes my comments, but I'm happy to um, expand on any of that if you wish. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. That's, that's, that's really helpful. Um, let, let, let's hear from others and then uh, I may come back to you on some of those points. Let's hear from Mr. Brown and then we'll hear from the council. Could also anyone else who wants to speak raise their hands now, please? Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Mr. Brown. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, I'm going to make an overarching point, and I, I was going to pause at that point before going into the more detailed matters, but in light of Mr Barnett's representations, I'm, I might, may need to continue. Um, so this is in response to the first part of your question, which is whether or not um, the pro forma should be amended to require the retention to, of Sandridge House. Um, you'll be aware there has been a change of circumstances between stage one of the plan is stage two. This is a, a recent request for Sandridge to be retained. It arises from um, a 
response to the proposed modification plan from Heritage England. And in that they do refer to the planning application uh, submitted on the application uh, on, on the site in 2019. Um, that, that application was made by Patrick Ruddy Holmes. Um, it was uh, uh, at a point where Patrick Ruddy Holmes were uh, interested in buying the site from uh, the Crown Estate, who are the owners and continue to be the owners. Um, that was for a development of 33 new homes in the form of an apartment block of up to five storeys. Um, the council's reasons for refusal at number two um, states the loss of the existing building and its replacement with a substantially taller and bulkier building of non-traditional design would cause less than substantial harm to the significance of the listed All Saints Church and would result in the loss of a non-designated heritage asset, um, which positively contributes to the understanding of the history of the area. And this is not outweighed by a public benefit. So that's the reason for refusal, ma'am. Um, but the reason for refusal um, uh, needs to be considered in the context of the council's officers assessment of the application that was set out in their report to the Windsor Development Control Panel of the 4th of December, 2019. Um, and it may be that, that the council can provide this to you because I don't think it's in the examination library. In this uh, paragraph 9.5 in the section titled impact on the character of the area, it states the existing building, which is of traditional design and a subordinate scale in relation to its plot contributes positively to the character of the area, but goes on to say, whilst its loss is not objected to in principle, it means that any replacement building would have to con uh, contribute positively to the character of the area to ensure no harm arises as a result of the development. That same report to the Windsor uh, Development Control Panel, uh, paragraph 19, uh, uh, 9.18 goes on in the section titled Heritage to say, Whilst Sandridge House is not a designated asset and its loss is not objected to in principle, for a proposal to be acceptable in heritage terms, any replacement building would need to contribute as positively to the character of the area and the setting of the listed church as the existing building does. The current proposal does not achieve this. It's clear, therefore, that the council do not object in principle to the demolition of Sandridge House, provided that it is replaced by a building of suitable design. On that basis, policy AL32 should not require the retention of Sandridge House. By leaving the, the allocation unchanged, the council will be able to assess proposals that might uh, uh, pr propose demolition uh, and redevelop redevelopment against those criteria in paragraph 918 of their committee report. If these criteria are not addressed satisfactory, then the council will be able to refuse any applications that they might consider to be inappropriate. So, Ma'am, what I'm saying is it's a matter for a, for a planning application based on the council's advice uh, to, their, to their development control panel. So I can pause there or I can go on to, to addressing matters of community density and significance yeah i'd rather i'd rather you went on as i said it's it's best if you say all that you want to and then if i need to come back i i will and i'll just make sure that we we have time could you also um to go on and address anything that you that you want to and anything that you heard from mr barnett's but um obviously this is a site i'll i'll go and look at um if I were to conclude that I felt the building should be retained, what would that, as the developer, what would that mean, um, do you think, in terms of the capacity of the site? What, what, would you, what would you envisage the capacity of the site being then and what, what form of development um, might be appropriate? Thank you, Mum. Same question, I'll come back to the council actually, like what, why 20? Why 20 dwellings? What can you fit in the house itself? And what are you envisaging on the ground, on the grounds, if, if 20 is the right figure? Sorry, Mr. Brown. 
Uh, thank you, Mom. Um, with regard to capacity, um, as set out in paragraph 2.5 of our hearing statement, uh, a development with a floor area in the order of 1600 square meters uh, could accommodate 25 apartments. So that that's applying um, uh, that that's applying the, the the space standards with an allowance of 15% for communal areas. Um, so this represents only a 34 percent percent increase in gross internal area compared with the floor space already provided by the buildings on the site. So um, you, 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 you get the idea that you can quite comfortably accommodate um, 25 units without a significant increase in development. That's a new uh, building, is that, sorry? Yeah, exactly. We're, we're, we're just doing some work on, on, on capacity if the building were to be retained, Mark. Um, 25 buildings, in our view, is therefore realistic and, uh, and achievable and in all likelihood could be exceeded subject to careful design. And on this basis, actually, we do ask for an amendment, which is to say at least 25 units um, to be more positively worded. Um, on density, um, a development of 25 units results in a density of 53 dwellings per hectare, ma'am, uh, based on the site area of 0.47 hectares. This is below the density of the adjacent Grand Regency Heights at 71 dwellings per hectare. It's also less than the proposed uh, or than that proposed for the Heatherwood Hospital site, where the flatted uh, component will be at 92 dwellings per hectare, and Heatherwood is at a very close proximity to this site. Therefore, a density of 25 dwellings per hectare is compatible with the character of the area and subject to good design could be exceeded. In terms of um, significance, um, uh, we, we, we're not aware of the document um, mentioned and referred to by Mr Barnett being in the examination library and therefore we haven't scrutinised it. Um, so in terms of significance, Sandridge House, in our view, and as, as actually, uh, as per the, the, the report to the Windsor Development Control Panel, uh, originated as a modest property and this is based on the work that went with the Patrick Ruddy Homes application uh, and that it, it's been significantly added to and altered uh, up until about 1930. Uh, Sandridge House as it stands today is therefore the result of multiple uh, additions during the late 19th and 20th century. Um, there is no evidence of significant use of Sandridge House in connection with the race course or by high society. Uh, and even if there, there were to be, um, this would be a minor claim of interest. While Sandridge House was used as temporary accommodation in World War II and, is a nurse, and as a nursery after that, these uses do not in their own right elevate the historic interest beyond a very low or negligible level. In architectural terms, Sandridge House is of a style that uh, is of a style and utilizes materials that reflects its erection over the late 19th and early 20th century. Speaking plainly, it's just typical of what people were building, um, but it does not have an elevated standard of architecture. And I, I would encourage you to visit the site, Mark. Um, on this basis, and as confirmed by paragraphs 9.5 and 9.18 of the report to the Windsor Development Control Panel, there should be no objection in principle to the demolition of Sandridge House, subject to the replacement building making a positive contribution to the character of the area. Um, so in terms of links to the church, uh, it's well documented um, that the rectory uh, and also Engelmere uh, uh, Hill Estate, which would have been to the north, uh, were the, the principal buildings associated with the church. Um, we hadn't heard before about it being uh, occupied in relation to the church before. Um, so whilst it's closely related in, in a physical sense, we, we actually don't think it's closely related in terms of its historical use. Um, in terms of the setting of the church, um, 
our, our assessment is, and, and again, we've put, put reference to this in, in, in our hearing statement, Mark, and it's based on the work carried out in relation to the Patrick Ruddy Holmes application. The setting of the church is self-contained for the most part and screened from all directions by mature trees. Uh, a good number of those trees are subject to a tree preservation order, so they will stay. Um, the change of this, uh, to the setting of the church will not have an adverse impact and will not bring about any harm, therefore. This is particularly true given the mature trees between Sandridge House and the listed church are covered by a TPO and would need to be retained through any redevelopment proposals. Um, you ask about the neighbourhood plan, as far as we can see that there, there is no reference to Sandridge House uh, in the neighbourhood plan. Uh, in, it, in its own right or as a designated heritage asset. Um, the the neighbourhood plan group may be able to correct us on that. Um, and in terms of transitional position, um, the Crown Estate, before they put Sandridge House on the market, did engage in pre-application discussions with the council in 2017. And again, the council can provide this letter to you if you wish, ma'am. Part 1.1V of the council's re response confirmed that the site is located on the boundary with two differing townscapes and there may, may be scope for a higher density development at this site. A carefully designed scheme could accommodate a successful transition between the differing scales types of buildings. Um, so I'm just we are still working on a, an idea of density and I'm, I will come back to you on that if I may, uh, if Sandridge House were to be retained, we are, we're not quite there. But in terms of responding to the points made by Mr. Barnett, um, I, th I think uh, the townscape assessment he's referred to, that of course was dated 2010, we're now in 2020 uh, and circumstances have changed in terms of development around the site. Um, <clears throat> I think it's wrong to suggest, and you'll see this, that um, Grand Regency uh, Heights has a completely different context to Sandridge House, given their very, very close proximity, literally immediately next door. Um, and I think actually, that, that's probably all I need to say at the moment, if that's all right, Matt. Can you just tell me so what, what, what's um, the sort of state of the building at the moment? What's, what was it? When was it last used and what for? Uh, it was last used as a nursing home arm. And then by the time of the um, 2017 pre-app and then the, the planning application in 2019, it was either closed or, or, or run down. And that was on the basis that it, it simply didn't fulfil the requirements uh, of, of, of a modern nursing home uh, and in that same report to the Windsor to Development Control Panel uh, officers accept that uh, the continued use of the nursing home isn't feasible and agree to the loss of that use. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Toombs, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, it'll come as no surprise uh, that we clearly fully uh, support uh, what Mr. Barnett was uh, suggesting, and he quite rightly points out, so, no, the, it is not listed specifically in the neighbourhood plan, but is covered by the neighbourhood plan design uh, guideline policies. I think also, um, and I don't want to put words into the council's mouth, but I think that one of the changes in the last sort of 12 months or so uh, is been an increasing uh, appreciation by the council of the importance of non-designated heritage assets. Uh, witness, in fact, the proposed changes to policy HE1 to ensure that it does cover non-designated heritage as well. And that may well have been one of the key differences between uh, the planning officer's view on the original planning application and what is being kind of suggested now. Uh, regarding the context of the environment it's in, uh, I will leave you to go and look at Regency Heights, which is one of the more hated um, buildings in the area, but unquestionably fronts very clearly the Heatherwood roundabout and Heatherwood um, and does not in any way really connect uh, with, uh, with this property or uh, this site at all. Uh, so thank you. Thank you.
Okay, a, a brief a brief point from Mr. Barnett, and then I'll go back to the council. Thank you, Mom. Yes, very briefly, um, I just wanted to pick up on uh, a couple of things that uh, Mr. Brown from Savills raised. Um, first of all, with the uh, the document I was referring to not being in the examination library, um, I'm very happy to provide that if you would uh, like me to. I would happily send that through. Um, so happy to do that. Um, uh, and also, I know he was making reference to some of the documents that were submitted as part of the Patrick Ruddy Holmes um, application. And in particular, there was the heritage townscape and setting statement that he was referring to and made several references to that. Um, but I'm not normally in the business of criticizing other evidence that might be put forward, but in this case, I'm afraid I have to. Um, that document, uh, is very, very thin on credibility as noted by RBWM's conservation officer who said that the heritage statement is not considered to be robust and, and has significant shortcomings. Um, it has a number of factu factual inaccuracies in it, including stating that the Sandridge House site is part of the townscape that Grand Regency Heights is in when it is clearly not. That is a, an error. Um, but also that report did not carry out even most basic research on either the heritage or the architecture and makes no reference to the links to the church, which, uh, as I've outlined, are very well established. So um, uh, I, I encourage you to read both the report that I will send through, um, but also that heritage townscape and, and setting statements uh, and compare the two, but they are not on the same basis. And I don't believe they should be considered on the same basis. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, back to the council then, please, to cover any points that you've heard, but particularly the question I sort of shouted out earlier, um, why, why is 20 dwellings the right number to revise this to, if indeed I think it should be? Thank you. Thank you, Mum. Obviously, we've heard quite a lot today about the history of the site, the uh, history of the building, and I won't repeat all of that. Um, we were hoping to have been joined today by uh, Miss Sarah Harper, our heritage officer. but Unfortunately, she's uh, indisposed due to a bereavement. Okay. Um, as uh, stated in our, in the, our MIQ response 11.5.22, and as we've heard, uh, the Council and Historic England uh, consider Sandridge House to be a non-designated heritage asset. And in uh, uh, their response to the proposed changes plan, Historic England stated that as a heritage asset, the building should be retained and conserved in a manner appropriate to its significance. In light of this, in light of this, the council now considers that the existing building should be retained as part of any development proposal. Um, and uh, if uh, this change is accepted, uh, we, we believe that it's necessary to uh, amend the uh, description from approximately 25 units to approximately 20 units. In, in response to why, why, why 20? Um, we do not feel that it would be realistic to uh, achieve 25 units within the existing building, uh, which we, we, we've measured it as having a, a gross floor space of about 1,250 square metres. That, that is approximate. Um, with the retention of this uh, building, um, we, uh, with 1,250 square metres, um, uh, on the basis of, or I haven't got the exact figures in front of me, but on the basis of, a, of, of an average size uh, flat, for example, we feel that 20 units would be about the maximum that could be achieved. Um, and uh, with, with the retention of the building and its conversion into flats, then the resultant density, which would be about 50 dwellings per hectare, um, would be would be compatible with the prevailing character of the area because it would essentially be using the existing building. So that 20 that you refer to is yes. what you feel could be accommodated within the building? Yes, within the building on the basis of a, a reasonable sized uh, flat. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to the significance of Sandwich House, again, as I say, I won't repeat all, all of the very detailed um, history uh, that uh, Mr Barnett has very helpfully provided. Um, we've heard that it's a Grade 2 listed building built in, in the 1860s, uh, and therefore we, we consider, we agree now that it's um, 
it is a non-designated heritage asset. It does contribute not only to the setting of All Saints Church, but also to the wider area of Ascot, uh, and therefore should be retained. Um, where, in terms of whether it has links to the adjacent listed church, uh, the answer is yes. Um, it, Sandridge House has been in the setting of the church for over 150 years, um, and uh, is was built at a similar time. Um, and you've got buildings uh, around it, such as um, to the south of the church, you've got Englemere Wood, you've got the Coach House, you've got Englemere Lodge, all, all of which were built in a similar time period to Sandridge House with similar detailing. Um, and collectively, this set of buildings, including Sandridge House, can be considered as part of the immediate uh, and wider setting of the listed building. Um, and we also have found no reference to Sandridge House in the neighbourhood plan. Um, and in terms of whether the site occupies a transitional position between areas of higher and lower density, the, the answer is yes. Uh, the council's townscape assessment, that's um, volume three of the Ascot group, so that's SD underscore zero three zero. Uh, defines the, the site as, as being located within the executive residential estates townscape area, as, as Mr. Barnett quite correctly says. I am looking at a, a map of it in front of me at the moment as well. Um, and the, the building next door, Regency Heights, uh, is Grand Regency Heights, is, is indeed in a, in a different character area. But nevertheless, it is in a transitional um, position between the higher buildings to the east and lower, lower buildings to the west. Um, and uh, in terms of the executive residential estates area, the key characteristics of that include low density development, um, unlike, as I've just said, the building to the east, uh, Grand Regency Heights, which is in the post-war residential flats towns, townscape. So um, it, would, it would form that transition between the, either side. Um, yes, that's... that's, that's I think that's all I was going to say uh, on that. I wasn't. I don't think I needed to necessarily uh, pick up on, on, on any of the points so far. Just a couple of things uh, arising from what you say. So, twenty flats approximately within the building. So, you wouldn't be envisaging new buildings within the grounds now. Um, I mean, I think that that would perhaps need to be considered at the planning application stage, but I, I think we weren't necessarily envisaging that being the case, but um, but that, that would need to be considered further, I think, at, at the application stage. And just one thing you said made me sort of flap my plan backwards and forwards. You mentioned as um, something else that was bought it, built in the same style was um, Anglemere Lodge, which is AL... 19. Englemere Wood, I think. I said. Oh, I did say Englemere Lodge. So sorry about that. That, 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 uh, yes, that was, uh, I understand. This is information I've received from our heritage, uh, another heritage officer uh, who has given me that information. Heritage concerns about AL 19. Um, I'm going to have to go away and uh, get further advice on that because I don't have that information. Okay. But I, do I do take your point. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> thank you okay uh final point for mr brown and then we'll leave it there thank you uh, thank you mom um so just to clarify use of the building it was closed before the 2017 pre-application uh, inquiry so uh, unused for for more than three years um if I may, can we send you or the council provide you with the committee report I referenced and also the pre-application letter? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of capacity, in fact, we'd like to prepare a note if we may. Um, we think that subject to size of the accommodation, you could potentially uh, accommodate at least 20 units within Sandridge House. But there is a question about usability of space um, because it, it is an older building and fit, fitness for purpose, if I can put it that way. Uh, and picking up on your point, 
uh, if it were to be retained, then I think that there would be scope to extend Sandridge House uh, and there would be scope for development within the curtilage of Sandridge House. And all of that leads me uh, to continue to conclude that it ought to be at least 25 units within the pro forma. Um, and finally, just to say, is simply retaining it as is and trying to fudge accommodation within an aged and difficult building probably isn't uh, op optimising the use of this previously developed site in a highly sustainable location. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. I think we'll I think we'll leave it there. There's a few points to come back on, which I'll which I'll make a note of um, and advise the council in, in due course about that. But um, that so that that concludes the agenda for this morning. Um, thank you very much again for your useful contributions and from the people who haven't appeared so far, that was uh, very, very useful to hear from you all. So thank you very much. We resume at 2.30 this afternoon to discuss the sites in Windsor. Thank you. Thank you, madam.